This is the One Piece Podcast, episode 556, for the week of Sunday, February 10th, 2019. My name is Zach. And my name is Ed. My name is Steve. And my name is Alex. And on today's show, very special guest translator for One Piece and Weekly Shonen Jump. He's back. He's Stephen Paul. How's it going, Stephen? I'm sick, so... <laughs> Bear with me. Are you sick um, of us, or are you just sick in general? Uh, sick of everything. Okay. He's um, back. But, uh, he's back. He's Stephen Paul. I don't know what that is. Yeah, Neither do I. I'm just going to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> Always the best thing to do. We also have a special guest on today. We have Nathan Ortega, uh, the founder of Daxon Studios, and a lot more. How's it going, Nathan? Good. I'm happy to be here and talk about pirate stuff this week. Yeah. <laughs> I heard you used to listen to us a really long time ago. Oh, yeah. Many moons ago, I dropped off and on as I became, fell behind with One Piece, but I'm now caught up fully, and that's pretty crazy considering I've been in the series since 2006. It's Jeez. pretty hard to believe that I'm into anything for that long. So we're going to yeah. do, Alex and you will do a Romance Dawn segment uh, probably in a coming <laughs> episode soon, but um, do you want to kind of give a very brief overview as to like your One Piece history? Yeah, yeah, I've always been a big Age of Sail nerd, so um, and and also big into anime since the '80s and '90s. Um, but I kind of stumbled upon finally actually like giving One Piece a chance <laughs> at a dead end job uh, where I had a lot of free time to watch YouTube, and so I started watching the anime like backlog episodes, and then just man, it became so. I think like everybody, I got really really into it from uh, the Arlong Park arc was the thing that really hooked me. So and I've been really into it ever since. I really love its focus on characters and also a weird combo of cartoon aesthetics and history. So uh, I just, I think it's such a unique series and it's kept my attention more than most anime. It's yeah, I, I can't, I can't agree more. Uh, so yeah, nice to have you on Nathan. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So today uh, we are going to go through one piece uh, chapter 932, whose title is Shogun and Oiran. Uh, we also have an anime episode. Ed, do you have any information about that? That's the episode where the Katakuri fight ends, and the fight, and the one where they come out of the mirror. We're doing and... a double. We're doing a double. Anime. Yes, and the, yeah. yeah, and the one where Peckham's turns too long. It's also the second. <laughs> I heard about that. I heard there's a lot of Peckham's material in that. I like Peckham, so I'm okay with that. And plus, he's isn't he like Lion Mask in that episode? I should it's probably Mistance. watch it. Yes, Mask Mistance, Warrior. Right. <laughs> right um no i like i like that whole uh part of the arc a lot um so you could look forward to that of course we have peace together before we get started big podcast news we are on spotify please tell all your spotify friends um so the link is on our twitter we'll put it on our uh, website as well uh so you know if you have spotify now you have no excuse not to be listening to us. Although I would be wondering how you're listening to us now. Uh, tell your friends, tell your Spotify friends about that. I, I can't believe you keep saying Spotify friends and not saying Spotify friends. You know what? It's right there, Zach. Missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. Uh, we also, uh, we announced this last week. The full One Piece podcast goes to Japan is now available for all patrons on patreon.com slash one piece podcast. Uh, it includes deleted scenes uh, for those over $10 and a commentary from Anime Boston. We're going to say 2014, um, though I disagree with that, but Steve, Steve is insistent. Um, I should probably listen so I find out the answer to that. Um, you can check that out. Uh, that's all on our Patreon. And last but not least, we are now following the free and legal manga on both ShonenJump.viz.com and Manga Plus. Um, which is Shueisha, Shueisha's app and web uh, web browser uh, website. Website is the word I'm looking for. I am not 106. I am 31. Um, so please uh, check that out. Check check those both out as your One Piece manga source. Um, have any of you guys checked Manga Plus? I, I gave it a quick look. Uh, I, I know they've done a lot of fixes since we last talked about it. Stephen, have you? Uh, I have not checked it since uh, since the uh, the first unveiling, so I, I'm not sure what is uh, what might be new. But um, definitely go there. I mean, go hey, go there right now. You can listen to our manga recap with what we're literally talking about. So yeah, uh, it's right there in front of you. And yeah, there we go. Uh, good transition. Let's do some manga. All right. Yeah.
This is the manga recap for chapter 932, Shogun and Oiran. Ed, what's going on on this front page here? It's, um, this is actually a scene from the Venture Brothers. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so there is a... Uh, it's Goats Eating Letters written by Caesar, requested by Fuji. And what he's actually doing is he's hiring henchmen to build a weapon of mass slaughter together. To apply, please contact the following... CC, Caesar Cloud. <laughs> wow. Does that mean carbon copy? Yeah. 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 He's got the he's got yeah. the face for it. The, the correct shape of his face. Wow. Anyway, yeah, so the, the goats are these posts. He's sitting at an outdoor cafe writing this wistfully, hand uh, directly under chin. And the goats are eating them <laughs> off the walls. So is this where they found the toad goats? There right, Alex? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. There you go. Toad uh, plus goats equals toad goats. Toad yeah, goats. I yeah, he's he's definitely got a type. Uh I think I think Caesar, <laughs> he's got uh, like uh, his his application form says need not apply if you do not have horns. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fine print. That's there. the fine print right there. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, I think you'd also uh, read um, more about the job position is his twisted twin obsessions are his pot to rule the world and his employees' health. <laughs> uh, I want to love of just him running a super villain empire and all the bureaucracy that goes along with that i mean i would like to see that sort of like uh sort of like what buggy does currently right pirate yeah. pirate temp 10 pages I, I i i do wonder if caesar would would provide uh health benefits he is a scientist i doubt I think it the health, benef- health benefits we, 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 benefits. we really want his health benefits <laughs> Yeah, free yeah, narcotics you get, all the time. We, we, we it's candy that it. makes you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask which of these goats this is going to bring us back to 2010. Here is Pone Goat. Do you think uh, none of them? None of They're them. Not, none of them. None of no. them. Okay. So one of these might be Luffy. Luffy got turned <laughs> into a goat. Or Garp. Garp. I was thinking Garp. Garp. Uh, yeah, Garp. Yeah, that's a, that's a Garp goat. Goat Garp. <laughs> Garp. Uh, okay. Garp. Gorp? The world according to Gorp. Um, <laughs> My son is also named Gorp. <laughs> oh, speaking of, Steve, I'm supposed to remind you to make a Simpsons reference on this episode. It'll come. You'll Ed, probably be disappointed. I but... will definitely be disappointed. Ed, you want to start us off on the first page? Sure. We start back in Orochi's castle in the flower capital, and they say to take it away, Kumurasaki. Ready? Yeah, no. Bang, 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 bang. Like, like, <laughs> Dueling banjo starts to play. It's that song again. Ah, yes. It's, this is the song. I am very pleased. It sounds so beautiful, it takes my breath away. Oh, wait. Why. Is she is she playing the is she playing Berlin from the Top Gun soundtrack? <laughs> <laughs> bang 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 bang. <laughs> <laughs> she, she is working her magic on those ladies. They are blushing like crazy. Yeah. Good yeah, on yeah. you, Robin. Also, I mean, it, 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 get the same face as uh, as the Shogun does. Yeah, you should know the Shogun's <laughs> voice by this point. But whatever, we'll talk about that later. Go ahead. I guess I forgot that. Anyway. I wonder why, whenever she plays that song, she always puts that mask on. Change scene to uh, Robin and the ninjas, and they say that you will have one chance. Just answer my question. Speak honestly, and we will grant you the gift of an instant painless death. Otherwise, only agonizing torture awaits you. Now, who are you, and what will you do? <laughs> Isn't that what they asked the Attorney General this week? Who are you, and what are you doing here? Um, <laughs> your daddy? That's Admiral yeah. Stockdale, Zach. Oh. Well, that also happened. So the guy, uh, the the leader of the ninja, um, what's his name again? Uh, Fuku, Fuku Raspberry. Raspberry. <laughs> Raspberry. <laughs> oh my god. He looks. Fukurokuju is his name. Okay. Fukurokuju. All right. Um. So, so this I is, remember. I guess, co- confirmation about the uh, the mask woman being uh, Komosaki. Yeah. 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 And uh, I wonder why she puts the mask on. <laughs> Probably is crying or something. Yeah, a hundred percent crying. Because it's a very. I'm sure that it's a song that's of some significance. Uh, if I, I, were to... I, I wonder if this is another like Oda taking cues from Game of Thrones, like she's playing the Reigns of Castamere or something. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, uh, I don't know if you guys mentioned it on last week's podcast. I I can't remember. Um, but the uh, the ninjas like the whole. Uh, different kinds of ninjas. Uh, 
the catfish that's there. Uh, catfish in Japanese folklore are, are commonly associated with earthquakes. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I thought that was uh, that was an interesting uh, choice to put the uh, catfish there. Um, I don't catfish? know much more. Cat, cat, no, I, I you understand. <laughs> Anything the uh, yeah the, the other thing that I, I didn't get to say last week um, was that the, uh, the Fukurokuju, like as being one of the uh, you know the seven lucky gods in sort of Japanese uh, folklore, uh, like I you know I was looking up his name just to be like okay what's what's the deal with this guy is there some reference here because I you know it did not uh, ring a bell for me and I was kind of amazed that like the one guy who maybe most of all looks like oh my god that's the most Oda design that is like exactly how like the only difference between that and the actual like like uh traditional depictions of the uh, the god fukurokuju is that fukurokuju looks older uh this guy is like the cool daddy version of him with the sunglasses <laughs> and everything but uh like the cone head is exactly the same which is just amazing to think that like <laughs> that that's like the most stripped down like uh bare bones uh design uh change oh that could have right. made <laughs> and it's uh, and he still looks so crazy. So it's it's fun. Wow, it's he looks exactly like him. That is crazy. Um, yeah. I I do want to add also. Uh, what the hell was I gonna say? Uh, I forgot. Anyway, uh, why don't we why don't we continue? Uh, okay. wait, I'm continuing. Perfect. Uh, so we go to the next page as uh, Robin stares intently around, thinking of her answer as to what she's gonna say. We have a. Uh, weird naruto villain um guy we have hanging on the ceiling guy and we have creepy shuriken girl guy guy wait no that doesn't work um <laughs> you know you should really androgynous uh, you should really come up with uh, official names for these characters Zach. me i'm not jammer um, um who has shikamaru broccoli gara Perfect. And, Flower Shinobi. And the rest of the characters from My Hero. And the rest. <laughs> uh, and we have Fukurokuju, uh, who stares on as Robin says, Ushi Mitsu Kozo. I was looking into the flows of money through the flower capital. Now, can you remind me, Stephen, Ushi Mitsu Kozo? So Ushi Mitsu Kozo is the uh, Robin Hood character. Oh, right, right, right. Um, yeah, but it's kind of interesting because I, I mean, not to not to spoil this ahead of you reading it, but it like it's not the 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 page here does not really like definitively rule one way or another if she's being truthful about that or if she's kind of putting on a ploy. It's it's kind of oddly phrased, in my opinion. It sounds but, like a ploy. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it sounds like she's making it up. That's, yeah, that's what I assumed. But. I'm not entirely sure of that. I mean, this is like Robin's expertise is having a mm -hmm. cover, you know, I mean, think of all of water seven in any lobby. Um, and, and he responds very clever answer sees her. Um, and the shurikens go flying out in every direction. They hit Robin. She's strangled by the neck. This does not look good for our hero. Um, as he answered that Ushimitsu Kozo already appeared in the capital a short while ago. So that seems to kind of, uh, you know, say that even if that was what she was doing, you know, obviously she, this was, you know, she's, uh, I guess it can't be, be what two she's places doing. at once. Yeah, yeah. Um, or can she? <laughs> well. <laughs> very good transition. Perfect. As we see, uh, that was not Robin, but a flower clone. Um, which shocks all of the seven, whatever they're called. Um, what are they called? Uh, Onibabanshu. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now, Nathan, not to call you out at the beginning of the podcast, like I, <laughs> not knowing all the different names and all the different, I am with you in that camp. Usually I'm pretty good at that, but I have just been, I don't know who anyone is. <laughs> One Piece finally yeah. broke us. Yeah. I do, th I do think that like, it's helpful that Oda's art style is so unique that I kind of don't need to know their names except right. for certain points where they make a, a, a reference and they go, oh my God, you mean him? And I'm like, who is that again? But for the most part, I, I can follow just because everyone is so distinct looking and can understand how they relate to each other in that way. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I, yeah, I had a question. So, how many of you guys recognize the name Oniwa Banshu from like Rurouni Kenshin, for example? So, uh, oh, yeah. it, it it just so happens that uh, for the latest Toho Yara, we had to watch um, the first Lone Wolf and Cub movie, and uh, the uh, the um, Oni Oni one uh, Oniwa Banshu are are a part of that. 
Um, mm. They they come to kill uh, um, uh, Ito. So uh, yeah. that, it was that was very fresh in my mind. Uh, I've not I've not read Kenshin. So so yeah, mm. Robin disappears, and we see she was actually behind the door and uh, telling the reader, ah, she was using a clone. You know, if we didn't get that by this point. Um, and everyone else asking whether she's a shinobi or some ghoulish spirit or, you know, and the, the main guy, I'm guessing, uh, uh, Fukurokuju basically says, look, doesn't matter. Ninjutsu sorcery, her original body must be nearby. Find her. Um, S- Stephen. Uh, Steve. Steve. Sorry. One of the Steve's. It's me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and as, uh, Robin, uh, tech, tech, techs away on her. I think she's wearing, is she wearing wooden sandals? Probably not. Um, but she whispers into, I, I don't, I, I feel like we've seen this technology before, but this is the first time I'm really kind of realizing it. Are these, <laughs> these look like trans- slugs? Yeah, they're transponder snails, but they're long and vertical. They look like a, like a <laughs> Bait transponder. Pins. I was going to say they look like taquitos, but. Uh. <laughs> Trans- transponder snail nanos. It's the new model they put out. <laughs> mm. Um, the I shuffle. Anyway, <laughs> she uh, she whispers into it. She's like, Onami, Shinobu, Bunkichi. Okay, I'm not going to whisper this whole thing. She's like, forgive me, my cover is blown. I've spotted at least 11 ninja within the palace. And uh, meanwhile, under the castle roof, uh, we see uh, Nami, a.k.a. Uh, Onami, saying, what? Robin's, Robin got seen by 11 of them? And Shinobu says, where are Robi's guards? Find out where she is. Oh, God, i got to pace myself here. <laughs> Fukurokuju and the Oni Wabanchu, yeah, are the best of the best. They're the elite ninja. And at the castle well, we see Bonkichi, aka Brooks, saying, Oh my, how could Orobi of all people get busted? And just when I finally got a job that isn't gathering food for once. Um and then uh oh uh is this Fukurokuju again? Or is yes. this yeah. okay, yeah, this is him. Uh he says, like, be smart, Shogun Orochi is like having a good time, don't ruin it, don't cause a stir. It's just like it's just one measly rat. And they say yes, sir, and they all dart away. Is um, uh, Fukurokuju short for Fukuroku Junior? <laughs> can call you Fukurokuju. The kids could call you Fukurokuju. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a stupid joke. Yeah, well, yeah. If I were, I love guess but... last week I would have made that joke then. So. <laughs> Uh, anywho, uh, a little bit of time passes. We hear some music playing in like the banquet hall as uh, Robin re-enters. Uh, the uh, not not Odin. Sorry, what's what's this schmuck's Orochi. name again? Orochi. Literally the opposite of Odin. <laughs> I know. That's yeah. why I didn't want to say Odin. Yeah. <laughs> Orochi says, "Like you there, new girl, Roby. Where have you been? Come, come closer." Um, I'm getting a job of the height hut vibe here, actually. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, he's huge i mean yeah that's what i mean he's huge and creepy it's a good combo look at his lap there's like six of us sitting on it <laughs> anyway um uh robin uh says like a phrase she probably read on the internet somewhere she says the best place for a leaf to hide is in the forest there's no escaping now albert einstein <laughs> Do you, there's a John Oliver thing about fake quotes. You just anyway, go ahead. Uh, and then she puts on a face. She says, "Forgive me for not being here sooner, my lord." Heart. She's texting. Uh, I have so many things I wish to speak to you about. He's like, "Well, aren't you sweet? I like this very much." It's like, "Are you two after the lofty seat of being my official wife?" Uh, and he lets out another big laugh. And he gets a poke on the shoulder from uh, from Arobi. I wait. I mean, Komorosaki. Uh, she says, "Why are you too cruel, my lord?" And she makes a little pouty face and and puff cloud. And he says, "Guho, don't sulk, my dear Komorosaki, my dear, dear, dear female, dear girl." No. <laughs> um, <So. laughs> <laughs> and then uh meanwhile like the other gals are just like i wonder if shogun orochi has any idea of what komurasaki's really like and the other girl says like for that beauty he'll overlook anything and uh robin then takes her mask and like covers the side of her face which we uh, see is because the um 
the ceiling ninja, the stitch ninja here, uh, is um, is present uh, down the hall, and so she's hiding her face uh, from him as he's looking for her. Uh, oh, is something the matter? And she's like, no, no, but, but please tell me about Onigashima. And uh, he, he's like, oh, why, why, why do you ask about that island? And uh, meanwhile, we see uh, or we hear some uh, some of the gentlemen at the uh, the feast here uh, having a conversation about Lady Komurasaki, talking about how beautiful she is and how jealous uh, they are as she is uh, sitting on uh, Orochi's lap here like a um, like a toilet dancer for Jabba the Hutt. And uh uh, but they, they're also afraid because they know, like they they understand that she has this uh, sort of secret mm-hmm. reputation, and they're like, yeah, well, don't worry, you you will never have to deal with that because she's not interested in you. Um, and then they uh, they address Kyoshiro. She came from your pleasure hall, boss Kyoshiro. You must keep a very firm handle on her, I imagine. And uh, Kyoshiro has a good line here. He's like, you seem to have confused a geisha for a pet dog, my friend. A person is a flower. If you are not the clear, pristine water at her roots, how is a woman to bloom into her true beauty? And the guy's like, whoa, hey, nice one. You got me there. And uh, then there uh, he continues remarking about how um, amazing it is that uh, that Kyoshiro was able to essentially marshal uh, Kaido's Toby Ropo, his like famous, you know, headliners to to do his bidding because, uh, of course, that all started when uh, when Sanji beat up the um, uh, the uh, the guys Kaku in in Suke and Kuni. Uh, he said, "Oh, you're, you know, that was a, a that was a lot that you did. That was a very fierce retribution." And uh, Kyoshio explains that uh, well, you know, the thing about about Yakuza is once you have shared your cups. Even the lowest flunky is family. So imagine that your child came home beaten to a pulp. What would you do? And the guy's like, wow, okay. Well, I guess those that's your Yakuza ways, huh? I'm impressed. And uh, Orochi steps in. And interestingly, he's he, he's not actually picking up on the, the point that uh, Kyoshiro was making. All he hears is like, yeah, he beat those guys up. And he's like, that's right. You must crush your enemies with overwhelming force so they can never get back at you again uh, because he is more preoccupied with something else. Uh, even if your enemies might be ghosts. And he says, ghosts. Kyoshiro uh, does not look uh, amused. Actually, in this case, it would be p- p- pirate ghosts. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Ghost pirate. jeez. <laughs> oh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, he's uh, Orochi's breaking this down. Oh, uh, they, they might be lowly flunkies that, uh, that got beaten up, but this is no trifling matter because no one in the capital would dare attack the Kyoshiro family. So it means that we have outsiders in our fair city. All right. <clears throat> and, uh, and he continues. Let me put on my Rochi voice here. Now, since we're all here, you listen up and listen good. I'll only say this once. This is the 20th year since the death of Kozuki Odin. The year of vengeance, according to what his wife Toki said, Odin's will yet live. Here he goes again. <laughs> yeah, his flunkies don't seem <laughs> don't seem too, uh, too enamored with, with his harum, speech. Harum, harum. Harum. You ever notice how he sounds like Space Jam Daffy Duck? <laughs> My my goal is somewhere along the lines of Wallace Shawn and the Princess Bride. Uh, so uh, Orobi uh, listens listens on intently as uh, Orochi continues. Do you remember how Odin's a- Akavaya Nine, those men with their red scabbards, were so unfathomably strong? <laughs> yeah, and they're all dead now. <laughs> and their leader Kinemon is a most brilliant man. Was, you mean, but I can barely remember him now. Uh, They have returned to Wano 20 years later and secretly made their preparations. They are readying themselves to come and remove my head. Uh, But he's already buried so many people with connections to Odin. And still afraid of Kazuki. So uh, it's very clear that he is the only one in this camp who believes that... uh, Toki's prophecy is going to come true. And this is something that we've gotten um, pretty clear 
in chapters before this. Yeah. Uh, what's his face? The Yakuza guy who's Kyoshiro mm -hmm. uh, said specifically that he's stupid to, to still believe this, if I recall, right? Yeah. yeah, but it's but it's very uh, it's it's good to see him in his element. Uh, this uh, uh, this paranoid element. He continues. Kaido has already taken care of it, but over in Kuri, the Yokozuna and Jack's followers were recently attacked. The Thoba cook in the capital, the Ronin at the inn, attacked the Yakuza. These acts might have all been under Kinemon's orders. If if Firefox Kinemon and the uh, Akazaya Samurai should appear, I, for one, would welcome it, says Kyoshiro. I would enjoy the chance to show you my skill with the blade. <laughs> it is good to have you on my side, Kyoshiro. Odin died right before my eyes, but his son, Momonosuke, still lives. The boy's body was never found. The blood of the Kozuki clan has not yet died out. And they seek to return the Kozuki name to power. And no doubt they plan to take down Kaido as well. And uh, as he's can, uh, finishing up his, his uh, completely... His, his Aku opening monologue from Samurai Jack. <laughs> 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 um, everybody's trying to stifle laughter like, <clears throat> what a daydreamer. When we did that uh, Samurai Jack parody, we should have done it with Orochi now, yeah. in retrospect. We could have waited. Yeah. We definitely could have waited. Character-wise, yeah. he really fits Orochi pretty well. Yaku, yeah. Um, They're very yeah. similar. Uh, yeah. He's somewhere between Jabba the Hutt and Yaku. Yeah. I didn't and get also, the Jabba thing until this chapter. He's so huge. Yeah. yeah. And also, not to be pedantic, but when, uh, when he's talking about how Momonosuke's body was never found, you get an ellipsis from Komurasaki. What could Ooh, that uh, mean? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I uh, wonder if it's Mamanos case lost sister Hiyori. That's impossible. Anyway. No, it's Luffy's ah. mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's next, Steven? What a twist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then we get a, uh, a wide shot of the palace kind of nestled on top of the uh, that giant bonsai-looking tree as, uh, you know, the... Um, the, the retainers here are all either like whispering or thinking to themselves like, man, how cowardly can he be? I want to laugh, but I, I don't want to die. And like, you know, he has Kaido as his ally. Like, who's like, ever going to beat that guy? What's he so afraid of? It's like the Pika thing all over again here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, and uh, Robin kind of sums up the um, uh, the, the stakes of the situation here that she says, uh, Orochi seems to take the legend at face value. He believes it. But his followers don't take it seriously. But of course they don't. And I just want to note that, like, this this is a really fantastic use of, like, multiple levels of dramatic irony. Because, uh, like, uh, Orochi thinks that all these people are out to to get him. And he doesn't know this. Like, it's specifically just because there was this prophecy. And he is, like, looking for for signs of this, but he has no idea like how, in what way he is correct. It's like a paranoid fantasy, but he also is correct that the, all these people are out there and they are all kind of gunning to take him down. Everyone's and the common, but him actually. Yeah. And, and no, yeah, I but, mean, but he is also, but he yeah. is still a, a clownish figure because yeah. his reasoning is, is kind of ridiculous. And I love too, that he also says that, Oh, all these things are happening under Kinemon's orders when specifically they're all things that Kinemon told them not to do. Right. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's he's, kind of funny. He's too. right for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, I, I would say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and all of his followers are, are wrong, wrong for even, all the right, even reasons. though, <laughs> right. Even though they're the common sense in common sense terms, they are, they are, they are right to be skeptical of, of this story. Um, yeah, it's so, like if you found an actual conspiracy theory, out to be true you know, yeah that would yeah. be pretty yeah insane but right go ahead um but then all of a sudden the uh the situation is is broken this tense silence is broken by someone going ah! and all the guys like turn around like oh shit what who who did that don't laugh why are you trying to die and orochi being uh super uh super sensitive about this like turns around you get this super close up on his eye like what huh and uh, over we see we see that uh, it's Otoko um, off in the corner, like she's even around this uh, partition on the other side of the room, and she's laughing. Ah! 
and like the the women are trying to 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 make her be quiet but she's she just finds it so funny that everyone is making fun of the shogun she's kind of reading the room uh and he's like who did that did you did you just laugh at me uh and so the you know the guys are are panicking they want this uh you know this uh, uh this obstacle this interruption out of the room but she just can't stop you know we we know her uh her her characterization uh she just laughs at everything um even though she she knows she shouldn't and uh they're you know the, oh that's a, that's the oiron's camera make her stop and uh robin is is wondering what's going on komurasaki is noticing uh this uh this situation and uh orochi is um He's getting up to deal with this himself. He says, this displeases me. I am the Shogun. Do you think that I am afraid of this unfinished business? And uh, he's drawing his sword. And uh, you know, there's like this cinematic panel of him uh, rushing forward with the uh, the sword kind of right in the, the front view as the scabbard uh, drops on the ground. And people are pleading with him not to do it. Uh, and he says, I am the victor. I beat Odin. And then uh, suddenly, uh, you know, Komarasaki, she has her eyes uh, shaded and then she gets to her feet and uh, she kind of commands uh, everyone to stop by by yelling out, stop this, my lord, she's but a child. And uh, they notice, oh, that's that's the Oiron. And this other guy is skeptical that he thinks she's not actually going to fix the situation. She's just got some some scheme up her sleeve that uh, she is uh, she's working on. Um, but he tell, but uh, Orochi tells her to be silent, and his his pupils are starting to look a little more uh, bestial, I guess. Uh, it, it, they're kind of elongating compared to some of these other panels. So, it's like his reptilian um, brain is taking over almost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I do want to note uh, quickly here that Orochi is not angry because he thinks that everyone doesn't believe him. He is angry because they. Th- he thinks that they think he cannot take care of Kinemon and all of the rest of them. Um, because and, and through all this, he's like, everyone here believes me, obviously. The thing that they're laughing at is my ability to, to take care of this. Um, yeah, that or, or that, or, or that, you know, he's, he, he realizes, like, he knows deep down that he is afraid and that it's, like, the yes. most sensitive spot that... Uh, he's paranoid again, also paranoid that people will find that out or something. But it, it I'm, I'm more to show that Orochi believes to the core of his being that he is correct. And even as Steven said, you know, there's all these layers of dramatic irony that he shouldn't believe that, but he is right about believing that. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Uh, and he, he proceeds to slice the door or the wall, uh, from which, the other attendants and uh, Otoko are hang, hanging behind uh, right, in, right in half and says, You dare to laugh at me, child. Um, the other attendants are pleading for somebody to help her because she has a laughing tick and she doesn't mean it. Um, but the others saying, Oh, there's no point. Just forget it. And uh, they plead, of course, She's just a girl, my lord. Have mercy as, as Orochi is moments away from slicing Otoko's neck. But... Uh, out of uh, out of nearly thin air, um, Komorosaki raises her hand and, in a panel that is sure to be uh, famous in this arc, uh, slaps uh, Orochi across his gigantic, huge head. Um, and uh, Otoko is in a daze and knocked back um, with with fun, swirly eyes. Um, and you see uh, this really great um, this really great panel of. Uh, of Orochi's smacked face. Um, if there's anything that Oda, Oda is really great at drawing, it's people like post punch. <laughs> Those are some of my favorites. Um, and everybody is completely flabbergasted. They are uh, white as a ghost, and uh, they 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 say, "Oiran, what have you done? Are you kidding? Apologize, Komonosaki. Get on your knees and grind your forehead into the floor." Uh, says one of them, and and she stands her ground and says, "I refuse. I do not grovel before anyone." And Robin is uh, Robin is uh, getting ready to to use her her uh, abilities mm. um, just in case something happens here. But uh, Komurasaki continues. When I know that I am in the right, I do not need to give an inch. Um, she says, and and in in his stupor, 
Orochi says, Komurasaki, I was actually considering making you the wife of the Shogun. <laughs> <laughs> so be it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nathan, finish us off. Sure, yeah, it's an up-close shot of all around uh, being defiant to that disgusting, pathetic attempt at trying to sound tough. Um, with her saying, if you would prefer a weak woman, then strike me down right now. I am the daughter of a samurai. I will not disgrace myself. And then the next is a big old spread of a uh, giant, multi-headed, dragony thing that he turned into. Say, do not speak to me of a warrior's way as he glorified harlot language. Uh, Kumurasaki, <laughs> eek, we are in the palace, uh, Shogun. Uh, and then Robin grabs a toko and hightails it out of there with her observing that, hey, are you the lady from the soba? Um, and then another shot of her trying to escape the cluster F of dragony nonsense happening behind them. I found the woman. Don't let her escape. And then uh, what's the OK? I missed the name of the guy with the like pompadour that was For speaking sure. earlier. Yeah, he's all like, well, 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 Bedlam has arrived and pull, starts to pull out a sword just as it crashes to next chapter, February 17th. So. They know how to end on an exciting cliffhanger, like usual. No kidding. Kyoshiro <laughs> is obviously supposed to be like Littlefinger here, right? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> watching Game of Thrones with Oda now. Uh, so that is the end of this chapter. Uh, let's go around the horn. Uh, thoughts on this? Let's start with Steven this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love this chapter. This was a, I mean, it was a very dense chapter. There's tons of, of dialogue in it, but I thought it was a a very rich one. Like it felt like he really built this, um, you know, this sort of pal- palatial feast scene um, in a way that was like, frankly, kind of Kurosawa esque, like you, you know, especially when it, when it really turns like the, the sort of tension in the scene turns when uh, Otoko starts laughing and all of a sudden it goes from like a sort of celebration to uh, like this almost, um, you know, there's there's almost like kind of shades of like a domestic abuse type thing of of this, you know, the, the patriarch, this like the guy who's the boss in charge is is sort of, uh, you know, going out of control. And he, you know, he needs to punish uh, the, the person who is upsetting him. And everyone else knows that they are kind of powerless to stop him. And there's all this like pleading as he's trying to, you know, to kill this this little girl. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it feels like, uh, like I said, very Kurosawa actually, like I can imagine seeing these shots with like 30 actors sort of scrambling around and, and all of this, um, uh, you know, just sort of chaos in, uh, in the, the goings. And I, I thought it was very vividly, um, done. I, I talked about the, um, the, the dramatic irony, which I found to be, uh, really well, uh, written as well. Um, I, I feel like we're we're getting a very good glimpse at kind of what makes Orochi tick, and um, I'm I'm reminded a little bit of um, of the the two villains, uh, erstwhile villains in um, in Fishman Island, in the sense that you know you have two guys, and like one of them seems to be the muscle, and the other one is is decidedly not the muscle, and therefore kind of gets a bit more. Uh, comical or, or a bit more outlandish uh, personality, um, which at least in terms of like the writing, I enjoy that more. So I, I'm really I like the way that he's depicting Orochi, even if he is rather buffoonish. Like he's got some great dialogue, and he's just a uh, you know he's a he's a very big character in this scene, and uh, so he's he's really interesting. Um, as far as I don't know, I'm, I guess I don't know what else to say. So I'll, I'll let somebody else uh, take it from here. Uh, Nathan, do you want to go? Sure. Um, so this whole arc so far for me has been a little hard to kind of parse. I think actually because I thought my knowledge of Japanese history and culture was pretty good. And then I start reading this entire arc and I'm like struggling to kind of keep up and understand the stakes and who the main players are. But I think this is the first chapter where I first, I really started to understand sort of the major players and how they relate to each other and what the main conflict is going to ultimately be here. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate that Robin has something to do because <laughs> that poor girl, she doesn't always get really important or interesting things to do. It often feels like she's kind of getting sidelined. So for her to be kind of at the center of this of this major moment, it onboards you with a lot of information about what the main conflict's going to be was really cool to see. 
Um, I, but I'm glad I got to hear you guys talk about it because this is exactly why this podcast exists <laughs> for me. Um, was that y'all made it make more sense and give more context to sort of what's happening here that I maybe didn't pick up on the first time I read through it. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, but it's just cool to see kind of like the next because it's obviously this is part of the building block phase of One Piece and every arc. There's always that that uh, part where you're kind of seeing them put the pieces on the chessboard to then be able to kind of see how they interact with each other and how everything is going to explode later on in the arc. And I think this is where it's really starting to pick up speed. So, so I just appreciate it. Kind of the, the pacing picked up quite a lot with this with this segment. Yeah, uh, I'm in agreement. This is a great chapter. I loved every second of it. Uh, Zach, I think you tweeted something to the effect of. Um, Oda has been really good about uh, each one. Like a lot of these chapters seem like uh, like little stories in and of themselves. Yeah, I was gonna say um, all of them, but then I realized there's a. I think last week probably isn't a great example of that, but most of them are. I think. Yeah, um, Stephen. Yeah, your your observation on this being kind of Kurosawa esque is very apt, uh, especially in the staging and uh, exposition uh, followed by. Um, followed by something uh, uh something climactic uh in a way uh boy the first thing that came i came out of this chapter thinking was i love orochi's zoan design so much it is it is great yeah. it looks yeah. it looks imposing and goofy at the same time um like just as goofy as him but uh yeah those uh those snake heads are really um they're really something they all look uh similar yet different um I, I, we've we've covered this on the show a couple times before, um, but uh, as a reminder, uh, I believe he has the Yama, uh, Yamata no Orochi uh, type zone. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it will get an official name next chapter. I'm, I'm assuming the uh, Dio Dio um, fruit, uh, dragon dragon fruit uh, model Yamata no Orochi. Um, but it's uh, like a, a an eight headed serpent, and the main head I think is the eighth one. I believe. Uh, if, if my memory serves me correct, but, um, but yeah, uh, we get a full, a full view of this. It's, ah, oh God, it's such a solid looking design. I feel like I can just reach out and touch every single one of those heads. Um, and, uh, I'm really, I'm really stoked that, uh, Kumurasaki is such a, like right off the bat, she is just a fearless, a fearless character for, for some reason. Uh, we have, we have yet to, we have yet to find out. Um, and I believe Greg uh, tweeted at this earlier, um, but I'm in inclined to agree with him that I am I am kind of shocked that we saw her true nature so quickly in this arc, um, which goes to really show you um, how Oda's pacing has really improved since uh, my <laughs> since Dress Rosa. Um, like Whole Cake, we was I thought was breakneck speed, and and we're going and we're chugging along through Wano in a really great uh, really great pace. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't feel too fast to me. It seems that like there, I'm getting the most out of every chapter that we've had so far. Uh, that's sort of where I'm at. Oh, uh, Robin doing stuff was also cool. I hope <laughs> to see her um, do multiple clone jutsu or whatever mm. it's called for Naruto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve, uh, uh, you're gonna have the least interesting uh, opinions here. Cause I didn't feel too strongly about, uh, this chapter. What can I say? Uh, it was very dense. I felt like this was the longest time I spent reading a chapter first time around in quite a while. Um, but it was good for Robin. It's a good Robin chapter. Uh, no one else brought this up. So I actually feel more relieved about this. Uh, I get Robin and Komodo Saki mixed up all the time. At least <laughs> reading this chapter. Cause it's not so much when you see like their full uh, design, but a lot of these panels are close-ups. So I, you know, speech bubbles are covering like the top of their hair. So oftentimes I'd get confused. Yeah. And then I thought, why doesn't Robin just like pull a crusty and just stand next to Komorosaki and go, hup, 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 hup. so then the ninja's like, oh, I'm seeing double two Komorosakis. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you can usually tell like, cause the only thing that they have different noses. That's that's about it. Okay. Well, now Oda's starting to forget how to draw Robin's nose. Well, I yeah. I noticed this chapter. He definitely looks like he takes more care of doing yeah. that. Like mm -hmm. this chapter, I was noticeable for her like her for her nose. Even that last mm -hmm. page, you could see. 
Um, so not just that, but her eyes are different. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Eyes are different. Yeah. Big time. That's she what has I was the trying to eyes. But it's subtle. yeah. That, I remember that. Yeah. The the last two uh, shots of Komen Usaki in this uh, had very Otohime vibes. Uh, very. Uh, how could I put this? Like if you were drawing a cartoon version of the sun and its rays. Those are the kind of eyelashes she has. But then again, Robin kind of has those eyelashes too right now. It's I man, it's weird for the artist to not be seeing a difference in the eye shape like you well, guys I, are. Well, with the I Geisha, think it's, it's style. It's supposed to kind of look like. Yeah, I was that was going to be my uh, yeah. Uh, but that that was just like that that was just like my experience reading this chapter. I'm not saying like oh man, Oda's dropping the ball. This is just the struggle that I had reading this chapter. But otherwise, yeah, um, maybe to kind of continue what Greg was pointing out, or you know, Greg and Alex were saying that Oda's pace has gotten a little bit better. Like we're not dragging this out. Like Komorosaki is like showing her true self already. Uh, it's good. It's make it's gonna make this arc move faster. I feel like this arc is already moving at breakneck speed. I gotta say, I feel like something. I feel like every chapter has been pretty monumental. So uh, I enjoy. Uh, Oda's uh, ninja designs. Uh, he is putting so much work into this, and it shows, and it's paying off. Those ninja designs are crazy. Ed, like, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, agree. Um, yeah, I kind of ha- have a think that um, Rochi is a grown-up version of the baby from Spirited Away. Does anyone else see that? I see what you got, Matt. Because he's the, he's a giant baby, so he grew up to be like a giant ugly man. <laughs> I guess anyway. most giant ugly men look like <laughs> well, babies. Compared, that... compared, I guess. I don't know. Just the way he looks. I like the way he gets um, slapped. Like even then, I think his his size is exaggerated even more than I think it actually is. And the way Oda sort of hides his sides with him sort of hunched over a lot, but then he becomes very menacing when he's going after um, Otoko. It's very and that's very threatening. But I do I do like the comparison to like this is a nice party. Where someone has like a child has spilled a drink and her father is now like hitting her, like mm. that's like this this whole thing just sort of went sideways and so they doubted his um not his belief as you guys said but his sort of his manliness that's what they that's what he thinks that they're insulting like y- you think I'm afraid of this you don't you, mm-hmm. you don't like yeah it's his it's his like sense of manhood that's insulted as opposed to like. He can take people like disagreeing with him, but don't say that he's a coward. Like, it's like I, I don't know. I, I wonder how much he gets the sense that people are, are actually laughing behind his back about this, and how much. I mean, he seems know. like. But he's so confident that he that, like, even if anyone would laugh at him about it, that they would, you know, he's so confident that he is right. I, I, I this is again a very relatable leader characteristic as of late. Uh, just yeah. the idea that I am confident in myself, but I am also paranoid about everyone around me not trusting in me. Rightfully mm-hmm. so, but you know, still. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I think it. I think it's well put together there. Ed, it, it was kind of kind of interesting seeing uh, Kyoshiro and Orochi interact directly too, knowing that we, you know, that Kyoshiro is like mocking him in private. Like, oh, he's such a coward and, and all this stuff. And then, you know, you're seeing them uh, face to face. Yeah. Or like sort of, it's sort of buddy buddy. Yeah. It means sarcastic. Like, oh, I would gladly show you right. my blade when you, you, you see, see what he's been saying about him behind his back. Like, right. You, you, you'd think he'd probably just stab Orochi in the back. Could be. I, that's, I think that makes Kyoshiro a really interesting character. He's kind oh, yeah. of. I feel like he's he's the closest to like the center of of Wano that we've seen so far since he he kind of travels on so many different levels in their society. It's I do like uh, Ed's comparison to Littlefingers from uh, Game from, of Thrones. Game of Thrones, yeah. I, I it he feels like that definitely. Well, he stole the he got, stole the line. Chaos is a ladder. Did he? <laughs> It says Bedlam has arrived. I mean, yeah. What, what is some, Bedlam? Some... I'm sorry. I like, uh, Bedlam is chaos, bed... basically. Yeah, oh, chaos. Okay. It's a messed up situation. Yeah, Bed- Bedlam is more. Yeah, no, I guess they're pretty synonymous. I'm trying to think so of the difference. It, is his voice going forward on the podcast just going to be talking in this kind of whisper? <laughs> probably big, should, yeah. Kind of accent. Mm-hmm. It was so, uh, speaking speaking on that. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he's uh, or I, I saw a, a, or a friend of mine tweeted like. Is that guy like that actor? Is that just the only voice he can do? I'm like, well, 
Well, if what? you've seen The Wire, he's, yeah. it does not do that with Carcetti. And no. you, and if you've seen uh, The Dark Knight Rises, right? I'm pretty sure he's the... He's, he's like the beginning. Like right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I forgot he's I'm going to shoot you. It's like, it's like, tell me or I'll throw you out this plane. It's like, yeah, why are you talking has, like that? He has Midwest dad and sex whisper. Those are his two voices. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he makes good money off those two voices. I can't blame him. No, you can't. You can't. I can uh, make yeah. money off of my sex with. <laughs> Ed, is and there the one, anything else? Yes, the one other thing I wanted to mention was that Kamurasaki has this very strong will to stand up to the Shogun like this. Even though she's kind of like... People have a low opinion of her sort of... Not necessarily her morals, but she's sort of like a... Even her like attendant seer is sort of a petulant or whiny or deceitful character. They don't necessarily have a high opinion of her. Like, man, for for her beauty, the the shogun will overlook anything. Like, yeah, she's got like a bad personality or something. But she stands up to well, we the saw, shogun here. Yeah. Like, it, like, she, like there has to be like she has to be in on something with Kyoshiro. Like, like there's got to be. I wonder if she does this just out in principle, or if she thinks that there's something standing behind her. That it empowers her to do this. Where does she, you know, get off slapping the the shogun yeah, and yeah. like where, where does she get that authority? Where does she get that sense that she could get away with it to do that? Maybe maybe she maybe she is just that morally you know uh, upset by it, but I don't see that really. And Kiyoshiro and uh, Kumurasaki, this is getting really. <laughs> Uh, tw- tongue twistery. Uh, definitely have some sort of history. Um, we saw them interacting in that flashbackish chapter mm-hmm. from, a f- I guess it was like a month ago, even though it was a few chapters ago. Um, and so yeah. I, I'm super curious. Again, uh, Hiroshiro is kind of this uh, center of the hurricane kind of thing, and he even has that calmness about him. So it's it's uh, super interesting to see how everything is swirling around him uh, in this arc. Um, it, and I'm, I have a feeling he knows more about her and her past uh, than, we're, than most mm-hmm. of the other characters, uh, including yeah. Orochi. Even, so even though Orochi knows accidentally about everything that's going on, I have a feeling Kyoshiro knows what's going on with um, Kumurosaki and, and Toki, um, perhaps. Uh, I, I guess I'll say my thoughts quickly here. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite chapters of the arc so far. I really, really enjoyed this one. Um, especially, uh, you know, I agree with Alex that ending that spread is going to be one of my favorites of this arc. I, I know for a fact. It's, it's really cool just seeing his devil fruit un- unleashed like that. Um, in the both derpy and extremely intimidating characteristics of Orochi there. Um, and Kurosaki does a really, a real 180, but not in an uncharacteristic way. Um, since we, you know, when we were first introduced to her, she does seem to be kind of almost Robin Hooding uh the men of wano uh mm. kind of taking from either rich or uh crooked people perhaps um it, it's not like, clear yeah yeah you could you could kind of see that they that they're they, that they could be seen as uh like the um like the the rich who have prospered from yeah. working with orochi or under orochi's leadership and you're supposed uh, to feel bad for them, but also not feel bad for them. It's, Oda does a very interesting thing with that. Um, and a lot of my qualms with this arc so far is that there are times, you know, where Alex mentioned what I had tweeted uh, when the chapter came out on Friday, that, you know, each chapter does kind of feel like its own story, which is really cool. But at the same time, it definitely creates an unevenness to this arc, where some chapters I'll really love, some chapters I'll feel kind of nonplus about. And the uh, and some I'm not going to be a huge fan of. But the cool thing that this arc does is when you find something out, it completely changes the undertone of previous chapters. Um, so finding out, we found out a lot in this chapter. We found out that Komurasaki was the shamisen player, uh, and we found out I think a lot about her. You know, we talked about her inner character, her actual character here being revealed, and I think. 
you know, those two things in particular and, and some other parts of this chapter kind of make that her introductory chapter a lot more uh, fulfilling and, you know, kind of, I think, have it bring a lot more gravitas to it or whatever you want to call it. Um, the other reason I really like this chapter is I think it's a really, you know, we had no women on this episode and now I'm regretting that because I think this is a really good girl power chapter. Um, hmm. with both yeah. Robin and Komonosaki really taking center stage here. I think Oda is demonstrating that he can do this. Uh, we've often discussed sometimes how he, especially with Robin and Nathan, you touched on this a little, just how she's taken a back seat. I think not just in this arc, but in Dress Rosa, we, we were, when we did the read through again, you know, she took a back seat in that she wasn't in whole cake Island. So it's nice to see Robin kind of taking her kind of front seat, which is still kind of like to the side because she is still kind of like the secret agent person in the, in the background, but we're kind of following this chapter from her point of view. And it's uh, a really cool plot device, uh, how we kind of follow her through all of this uh, ensuing bedlam um, and, and her inner monologue, which we don't get a lot with straw hat, the straw hats, um, so that's, I, I thought that was a really, really cool narr narrative, uh, way of doing this. Um, I could talk a lot about this chapter because I really enjoyed mm -hmm. this chapter. Steven, how long did it take you to translate this one? There's a lot of um, text. And yeah, last week's I too. Think, I think I, I, I rushed through this one pretty fast because the, the timing of when it came in was, was a bit odd. Um, so I, I kind of had to, um, to make sure I, uh, I rushed on it, but, um, uh, yeah, it was a, it was definitely a lot of, a lot of dialogue. Actually, I wanted to, to follow up on uh, what you were, you were saying about kind of the, the arc as a whole right now. And, and that is that I don't know how this is all going to shake out. Like once we get to the, the combat phase of the arc and, and that, that always, you know, shifts gears quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think, you know, we, like, like you said about dress Rosa, uh, the first half of dress Rosa, when we're doing all of the story exposition stuff is really good. And there's a lot of really exciting stuff in it. And then it starts to kind of lose steam and you get, you get a lot of samey material once it gets into the action phase of the story. So that, that you know, the same thing could, could potentially happen here, uh, too, we don't know yet, but I feel like with the the way that he kind of uh, brought us into this arc, where you know it, it's sort of spanning all the different layers of this uh, very um, very segmented society, and um, you know showing all these like portraits of these just kind of random people in in this this country, and uh, he's kind of bounced from from person to person, and maybe he will you know eventually start tying more of them together in but a lot of them kind of feel like just little one-off stories and i feel like because of that um yes it, it is uh harder to keep track of all of it especially when it's all you know it's very japanese and so there's a lot of very similar sounding names and and things that are hard to keep track of but i feel like it also is going to mean that this arc is going to be extremely like re-readable in the sense that like each time you read it it's it's still going to be very vivid because like so many of the individual chapters are just like these intensely kind of flavorful little stories of these people's lives and and how they all fit together and i feel like it's going to be very evocative like even on you know second third fourth readings uh, in a way that that some of the easier digestible uh material is is not always uh, like you can just sort of breeze through it faster. So I, I'm I'm kind of curious to see how that is going to feel in retrospect, because it's a it's been a very dense arc so far and a very it, vivid one. It also makes our podcasts. Uh, I hate to say this, a little less. Um, I, I, what do you call it? Like a little less able to last through time, which I'm forgetting. The <laughs> um, just because a, a lot of the stuff that we talk about each week, this week included. Uh, so much new information, I think, gets put into the story every week that it's mm. that it immediately becomes a, a, a little less, uh, you know, relevant um, mm. as each week passes. So you got to listen to our show immediately is what I'm saying. There's no time. <laughs> um, but it's 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 really cool to I, I completely agree. It's a really interesting way to put it that it, it is, I think, probably the most rereadable arc so far from what we could tell. 
Um, because a lot of arcs are like, I know what happens. I don't, there's nothing mm-hmm. secret here that I, anyway, uh, we've been talking about this for a really long time. Let's get into the next segment. This is a double anime recap for episodes 871 and 872. I'm your host, Sam, and today with me, we have, once again, we have Ed. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, just Ed. I, 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 was, I just realized now that I, was, I had the wrong episode playing in the background. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, well. I'll, I'll, I'll catch up. Uh, a couple of, couple of good episodes the last few couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. Uh, mm-hmm. Our first episode is 871. Finally, it's over. The climax of the intense fight against Katakuri. The title card begins at 3 minutes and 23 seconds. Uh, we are in the mirror world and we see what Brulee is up to. Because she's just kind of been left behind in the middle of all this all this action. Uh, and she's trying to cut her the rope around her hands. Fortunately, everything around her is sharp rocks. Yes, it's broken just a bunch shit. of rubble and uh, shards of mirror. <laughs> There's nothing but sharp things. So she's she's getting herself out of that bind for now. Uh, on the outside of the mirror world, Oven is uh, yelling at some of the decouplets or one of the, the one of the decouplets. Uh, oh, I just whole... wanted to say it was funny. It was funny when Brule said "short ass" in the subtitle. <laughs> which um, they're getting a little more liberal with the cursing, I think, in the subtitles. Yeah, I, there's a few interesting things. Um, so. There's this whole kind of gag where the the couplets are all getting each other. They're they're all confusing each other for each other. Like they're they're yelling at the wrong kid and beating up on yeah, each other. Yeah, it's like they a, don't know who each other is. Yeah, uh, <laughs> which one it is. Like, I mean, and that's good for killing like a minute. Some of these names include Nuji, Nusan, Nushi. They're all beating each other up because uh, one of them dared to say that uh, dared to ask. What happens if Katakuri loses? An oven will not stand for this. He is a Katakuri stan till the end. Yeah, and we get introduced, I think, to Raisin. We get his, I don't know if we get his name, but we get his, his cool hair and sword. Yeah, I think we got all the names a few weeks ago. So they're prepared for Luffy to kidnap Brule. They assume that is his, that's his exit strategy. They don't assume he's going to beat Katakuri. But he might uh, trick his way out of the mirror world by kidnapping Brule again. Nobody has faith in Brule. Uh, we see Sanji. He's in a cloak. He's sneaking around in an alleyway, uh, getting a light with his fancy lighter, his fancy cigarette lighter. I notice him blowing like clouds of smoke. It's more present with Sanji here in this scene than it is normally. Mm-hmm. Like there's more smoke than usual, and it's for a good reason. He's smiling. He's he's kind of looking over his shoulder. Oh, I guess this is gonna be our fair. This is gonna be our farewell pudding. What? And she's like all the way back in the the, the alleyway because she's too embarrassed to be next to him. I was getting emotional by the end of this. I like this scene. Yeah, this is a really good scene. Uh, so I mean, just, as much as he can disagree with some of the plotting, if, if but I think the core of it is that these people are sort of, you know, they're both sort of abused. They both don't really like their families, and they were just gonna get married to sort of you know, support each other. And I thought that was sweet, but it's also kind of fucked up. But so we're sort of left with, with, with what, with the, with what we got here. Yeah. There, there's this whole, you know, rigmarole of like playing the role of the bride and groom, but neither of them yeah. are actually into it, but maybe they are. Um, mm. But, but to, to the degree that they are actually uh, interested in each inter- interested in each other is actually kind of in spite of what their family was trying to do. There's sweet moments between them when they're like making the cake and stuff. Yeah, Sanji is thinking back to meeting her. Uh, I like this new like I did not think that they had to actually get some new animation of uh, like Sanji and putting right before the wedding. And it's really mm-hmm. well animated. like the, the character acting is really strong. It's like a surprising like, oh, this is actually like a really nice cut that actually they didn't have to go out of their way to, to draw. Uh, they could have just uh, repeated something from earlier. Uh, so Pudding is slowly approaching. She has this whole inner monologue about wanting to apologize because, uh, you know, she tried to kill him. Uh, she'd shot his sister, etc. cetera. Uh, but instead, she's just like, shut up. Because soon today. 
Yeah. And Sanji just laughs it off. I guess we're enemies, aren't we? I guess that's just what you would prefer uh, we keep being. Uh, and he, he punctuates it with, well, I'm glad if anyone had to play the role of my fiance, I'm glad it was you. It was a very, it was a very sweet moment. That pushes Pudding over the edge. Uh, she starts her, her face like scrunches up. It's the, it's the classic ugly cry. Snot's coming down her nose. She's trying not to cry, but it's all coming out. There's a lot of scenes of uh, Sanji in close up smiling. It's sort of like she's staring at his face. Like you're getting the sense that just staring straight into Sanji's face is just what she's doing. Uh, then there were there were definitely some little animation flourishes as oh, she's yeah. like wiping the tears away and she's trying to ask him for one last favor. Uh, Sanji doesn't know what's up, but she's pulling away at a cigarette. We see their feet. We see her getting up on her tippy toes. And then the camera pans up and we see the full moon and then we fade out. It's like, what was that? Uh, you ever seen the movie The Truman Show? Yes. Yeah. You never see anything. They just pan to the moon. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we come back to Luffy and Katakuri, who are kind of in the middle of their... They've, they've just hit each other. Uh one of the, the one of the changes from the manga is in the manga you never actually see them their attacks connect to their final blows. You just kind of mm. see their their fists or or Katakuri's big mace thing just kind of lifting away. Uh, but last week we saw them connect and now we kind of see them uh, separating. Then they they collapse. The ground just kind of falls out from underneath Luffy and uh, Luffy he deflates his gear four form just sort of fades into his regular form. Uh, that was really well done, I thought. That was a, that's a small thing, I think. But, you know, they could just sort of shortcut that and not, not necessarily show him deflating like that. But right. it's an easy, I, I, did, I, did, it's a, I did like it. It's a good-looking shortcut. It's a, it's a hard... It, I feel like it's a simple thing that's kind of hard to do. Uh, unlimited budget. Katakuri collapses as well. And then the, the clock keeps ticking as we move into the, the eye catch, which I thought was a nice touch. Uh, instead of like the the music, the fanfare that plays during the the eye catch during the wanted poster part, you just kind of hear the the clock going. Tch, 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 yeah. tch. Although it was kind of jarring, like because the way we watch it, there's no commercials, so it just goes straight into the other part of the eye catch, and it's just the regular music again. Yeah. A little weird. Uh, a little scene between Montdor and Morgans, and Montdor is bragging, "Oh, they're not going to get away. Even if Gold Roger himself came out of that mirror, we wouldn't let him escape." Because uh, Morgan he floats over ready. on his book, yeah, he floats over on his book and points a finger straight in his chest, like "See here, bird." <laughs> yeah, Morgan's is anticipating the the puff piece he wants to write about Luffy. Yeah, Capone ship. They're on their way to Fluffy Island. The, the their sails are starting to catch on fire because Big Mom's and Prometheus are just like right on their tail. Uh, Capone's got this big speech about you know let's let's at least die together, uh, but then. Fluffy Island is in sight. It's on the horizon. They're almost there. So then this is about, what, 15 minutes to uh, a time, right? One uh, I think that Luffy and Katakuri collapse around 20 minutes before one. No, but the, on the clock on the, on, on the fire tank ship is uh, about 15 minutes. Oh, is it? Yeah. So they've been showing that occasionally throughout the episode. They'll show, they'll show the clocks, and as you're talking about the TikTok of the thing going into the top... The eye catch is also, uh, also there. Yeah. Uh, so back on the sunny, uh, Brooke considers negotiating, quote unquote, with Smoothie by asking to see her panties from a distance. Uh, Nami doesn't appreciate that. That's nice that she stands up for even her enemies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, they're talking about how Luffy can't escape without Brulee. And they know that Luffy is definitely not thinking that far ahead. So how he's going to actually get out of the mirror. Well, there's really only one way it could go. Right. <laughs> Back in the mirror world, Luffy is pulling himself out of this crater. It, the crater doesn't really make sense. Like, why is it this big? Mm -hmm. Why did yeah. the gr ground like collapse that deeply? I don't know. But well, Luffy, it is a mirror. It's a magic uh, pocket universe anyway. Luffy pulls himself out. He's, he's still tired. Uh, he sees Katakuri laying face down. And he feels compelled to comment. Uh, even when he falls, he, fail, he falls face forward. Uh, then Katakuri, at some point, he gets up. And there's a shot of like Luffy looking up at Katakuri, who's standing again. And it looks really goofy. Like The, the perspective isn't quite right. 
Uh, but Katakuri is asking, will you come back to take down Big Mom someday? And Luffy says, of course, I'm going to be king of the pirates. And Katakuri just kind of has to smile at that. Uh, you're seeing very far into the future. And that's when he falls for real this time. Now on his back, which is a cool touch. I thought uh, I always thought I like that. He, even going back to the manga, because it was like Luffy's power of his like his determination and his will is the thing that he sort of has over Katakuri. I don't know if he has that ambition or he doesn't. I don't know. Does Katakuri have a dream? We haven't really heard it. No, I always read this scene as like it doesn't really matter who like beat who or why or who like who should have won. Uh, but Katakuri, he fell. And then he got up, and I think he got up just so he could fall on his back specifically. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the the fedora, the the milady fedora, as uh, Luffy pulls it out of his straw hat uh, and puts it on Katakuri's mouth. Uh, actually, I I'd, I'd wanted to mention that, like the the shot where Luffy is like looking down at Katakuri's beaten body and. Cutter Curry's just completely wiped and on his back. Uh, doesn't look as cool as in the manga. Like Luffy's body language is just, it's way more limp. Um, yeah. He's like, uh, he's like enfeebled by yeah. the fight. Yeah. Uh, but I do kind of like uh, Luffy's curiosity as he's kind of like tiptoeing around his body. Uh, so a surprise, a mysterious figure arrives. After uh, he sees that Brulee has escaped, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with Brulee in tow, we meet Mistums. Uh, some, I guess he's a lion mink of some kind. He's uh, got a... Mystery a, savior. Yeah, mystery savior. He's got a, a professional wrestler's, like a luchador mask on. Uh, the music here is, this is one of the, I think this is like a newer track that was introduced around Dressrosa. I always thought it sounded like way, way too close to a Hunter Hunter song. I have not seen that anime, so I can't say. It's like the same song. Uh, <laughs> but but it's funny when Luffy recognizes, uh, when Luffy realizes or, or just calls uh, Mistums out as who he really is, Peckham's, the, the big flashy Mistums title card just like breaks in half. And then it's just like a regular One Piece title card that says Peckham's. They're going to give him like a Soga King entrance. Yeah. Uh, Overtaken starts playing. Always good to hear that. Uh, Kakao Island is getting ready in anticipation. Uh, Sanji's still kind of peering out from uh, the, the alleyway. Peckham's and Luffy and Brule, they're they're heading out. And the last shot of the episode is like Oven's scary face, like coming up in front of the full moon. Like, oh, we're going to get him. And that's the end of that episode. The next episode is 872, A Desperate Situation. The Iron Tight Entrapment of Luffy. The title card begins at 4 minutes, 11 seconds. So all the Charlotte kids are getting ready outside of the mirror. Uh, I really like this shot that they come back to a couple times in the episode where a few of the decouplets are hanging out on top of the mirror and they're kind of framed in front of the full moon. Well, also, doesn't Raisin jump up there at one point in this episode? There's a lot of full moon stuff. Yeah. Uh, So the Charlottes are watching the shore. The sunny is, is appearing. Uh, they're like, yes, okay, this is it. We can stop them. They do that cool thing with like the, the moonlight shining over the Sunny's uh, masthead, which I thought was cool. We have Smoothie, who's still tracking them, and she's she's basically explaining the whole situation to the audience in case everyone uh, in case anyone forgot like who which characters are where. Get the little map. Uh, you know, Peckham's is he's carrying Luffy and Brule, and he's explaining what his plan is, which is to uh, go Sulong. Long. That's how he's going to kind of fight against the crowd of Big Mom pirates. And he's he doesn't like going so long because he he can't control it. He's not like Carrot, who's been trained to to use it. Uh, and historically, the only way the only thing that's ever been been able to calm him down and bring him back to consciousness is Pedro's voice. And we get this really cool little, I guess, flashback sequence, kind of uh, illustrating what what would normally happen when he goes too long where he's, he's rampaging, he's running through the, the woods. I guess they're on Zo, uh, and, and, you know, comes across Pedro. who's like, stop, everything's going to be okay. Uh, and that's, that sort of explains how that works. 
they show him all in shadow for that whole thing. And I, I, that, that, that works. So like, and they, I think they put uh, some effort into uh, more effort into like his un, like his body, the way his body moves as as Su Wong. It, uh, it's it's kind of it's terrifying. Like his claws are like as big as half of Pedro. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of the they put way more thought and effort into Peckham's Sulong stuff than they ever needed to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I appreciate that though. Yeah. yeah. So one o'clock comes. Peckham's jumps out of the mirror. Uh, everyone recognizes him Ill- immediately. The Mistum's disguise has not worked on a single person. And Peckham's is kind of uh, distraught by this, but he, he he goes forward anyway. He's putting the gun to group, to Brulee's head. I will blow your precious sister's brains out, which is another like crunchy roll subtitle. Like, whoa, you got, why, why do you got to get that graphic? Uh, he's like, okay, screw it. My, my identity is, is out there. He throws his sunglasses off. Uh, he looks up at the moon. Uh, he steps on his glasses. We, he's got his cute little dot eyes. And he's letting the moonlight in. Mm-hmm. So he's like transforming. He's going through the process. Uh, I love like Oven stepping in here. He's like, what are you doing, Peckhams? He's, he's, he's really angry. Like, why are you? Why is it you coming out of the mirror? What are you doing to my sister? Uh, his He steps on his sunglasses, which although I thought it was weird that he stepped on the sunglasses when he'd already thrown the sunglasses up and they went ting and I thought they would just disappear. I thought things just disappear when you do that. <laughs> yeah. He throws the sunglasses up into the moon and they like they disappear, but he, they oven can still step on them. Yeah. Uh, I love like how oven's eyes kind of like light up in rage and he turns the heat on and like it like the the gun in Peckham's hand is basically melting and setting his hand on fire. I wonder if that's like kind of an awakened devil fruit. Cause he's not touching him. I think he just makes the area really hot. Mm. Cause that's all he's yeah. really got is just heat. Right. Uh, and he like throws a big fiery fist right into Peckham's face. And it looks awesome. Uh, and does a lot of damage too. Yeah. Peckham's he, he really gets hurt in this episode. Uh, so like it's all, it's not quite like, um, uh, Luffy punching the world noble level of animation, but it's a very well animated punch. Uh, Luffy falls out of Peckham's, the front of Peckham's pants, <laughs> which is an interesting choice. The monkey in my pants. Uh, but, but Sanji notices, Sanji sees Luffy. He's like, oh, yes, this is it. Uh, and that's the eye catch of the episode. Uh, Sanji's calling into the sunny. Everyone's happy to hear that Luffy's out of the mirror world and safe. Uh, Luffy, he's he's still tired, but he's doing his best to jump out of the way and dodge the, the couple of two are coming after him. Uh, but as he's in the air, Raisin shows up, uh, and Sanji, boom, kicks Raisin, saves Luffy. Uh, they're they're flying through the air. Uh, Sanji's asking Luffy if he won the fight, and Luffy says yes, and uh, everyone's really happy about that. Well, actually, nobody here is really happy, but we're well, all Sanji happy. is, Luffy is, yeah. <laughs> The Nobody else will be island. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so the decouplets are shown up again. Lots of these Charlotte kids can use the moonwalk. So uh, Sanji's not really safe in the air. Uh, Peckham's is still uh, going for it. He's like, I've got more in me. And he's, he's looking at the moon again. He's bulking up some more. Uh, like this is, we're way past what the manga showed us, which is, the manga never even showed his full Sulong design. Like he's in the midst of transforming. Yeah, there's like some crazy. There, there's crazy art. Like at this point, like they, they do sketchy things that they don't really do. They use colors that they don't usually use a lot of, like greens and purples and pinks together. It's really weird. I liked it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it looks great. It's it just kind of feels surreal to have like to formally have another Sulong design. Uh, mm-hmm. That we didn't have in the manga, uh, really. I mean, if you look at the the bits and pieces you could see in the manga, there is there is, you know, consistency. But mm-hmm. uh, Peckham's is bulking up. He's rampaging. He's beating up on the crowds. Uh, but because he's rampaging, he can't really control himself. He's also going after Sanji, and like Sanji's up against the wall. He's trying to protect Luffy. Uh, Peckham's almost attacks him, but then stops. And then like he just sort of kind of nudges Sanji's arm with his claw to like show that he's being nice. Uh, and uh, Peckham's is, is 
in his monster form. He's like, go now. Take Strawhead away from here. Uh, and Sanji's like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And so they kind of go their separate ways. Sanji's back in the air. Peckham's is taking on the crowds and the decouplets and all them. Uh, but then you see like this lightning bolt like flying through the air, pierces right through Peckham's. It's Raisin. Uh, Peckham's is really, he's really getting it. Uh, Oven is commanding the army to start attacking him. Like, make sure he never he can never see the full moon again. They're all throwing spears. Uh, the spears were really cool looking. Yeah, Peckham's just gets annihilated. Uh, he's getting destroyed. Uh, Ewan shows up with his big ball and a stick thing, and he smacks Sanji out of the air. Uh, everything's looking everything's looking real bad. Oven's Oven's very happy with with the turn of events. Uh, but then an explosion happens, and we're like, "What? What? Who's that? Who's who's just just showed up?" Uh, and uh, it turns out it's Jorma. They've arrived, and they're on their ship, and they're doing their Super Sentai transformation animation scenes. I felt like this was even more risque than it was last time. You think so? There's a, I don't know. There, there, there was more. I don't know. I think there was more uh, dudeness in it. I think it's about the same. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm a fan. But they do this cool, like, this is what I was talking about with the art style. They would, When everything's been set on fire, oh, like, there's weird greens and purples and yeah, there's different like a, texture to the art. It's 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 really cool. <laughs> They're trying different stuff here. And uh, I, I'm, I, I appreciate that. There's almost like a crayon feeling to it. Something like that, yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Now the, the the colors of the Germa boys and girl, they're all flying through the air. They're just lights in the sky. Uh, they show up. They, sh- they surround Sanji. Uh, Ichiji's caught some bullets and he's dropping them. He's making this big kind of show of like, oh, what a coincidence, Sanji. You're here too. Uh, just being a, a douche. And uh, that's kind of how the episode ends. Yeah, that was uh, really cool. Any I like general liked- thoughts, Ed? I, I like, I really like both of these. Uh, you know, I did too. The only, the only part I didn't really like about it was, I mean, the couplets are kind of, I can, I can give, I can take or leave them. They're, they're just kind of annoying. They kind of take up time, but the, you know, got to push that episode, episode count. Uh, anyway, uh, the, I love the artistic choices, especially in the second episode. I really love that Sanji pudding scene in the first episode. It was very sweet. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I was, I was kind of, I don't know. The Katakuri Luffy thing. I kind of wish they'd done that in, you know, one episode where like he put him putting the hat on his face is the end of an episode, but I can see why they did it this way. Well, they're, they're back to, for a few episodes now, they've been back to one chapter per episode. So I think that's kind of okay. what, what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I really liked both of these episodes. I thought the first one I would describe as like more, uh, workman like in direction uh it's not yes it's not like super amazing in terms of like animation or or pacing or direction or anything like that but the story is really good like the sanji and pudding's goodbye is really good luffy and katakuri's goodbye is really good it kind of you you would you have to work really hard to kind of screw those up in adaptation <laughs> yeah uh the second of these two episodes super interesting uh adaptation wise because they really expand on the peckham stuff a lot and it and it makes sense like it feels it feels natural because it's that same kind of idea of like tapping into your your kind of like uncontrollable animalistic instincts and uh mm-hmm. trying to get by on that but also uh trying not to kind of lose your your sense of self in the middle of it um and and it and it brings Pedro back which is kind of an interesting it's kind of part of how the the ending of this arc works where you expect Pedro to like show up and like that. That's why they told us about Pedro's voice and like how Peckham's calms down with Pedro's voice is that you're expecting uh, Pedro to come back, but he doesn't mm. Peckham's hears the voice in his own head. He kind of, yeah. he kind of finds that self control himself, but there's still kind of that empty feeling. And there's still, yeah, this was, uh, kind of this like was the, it do, we, we don't accomplish as much as, as we think we're going to accomplish here. This is Goku helping Gohan at the end of the Cell fight, not the Bojack fight. I suppose. 
<laughs> no, because no, because with when he defeated Cell, it was like it was the spirit of his father that he heard the voice. But in movie Before nine, Jack, he, literally... he actually teleports from <laughs> from the other world. I don't think I've seen uh, that one all the way through. Movie nine, I know a lot of people like it. It's not my favorite. Uh, yeah. So I, I just like I feel like this is a case where what the anime is trying to go for and what the manga are trying to go for are pretty different but they're both really valid takes like the manga when peckham is just like he he barely even he gets like halfway through the transformation and then they just beat him down uh like it's just like extra pathetic feeling yeah i'd like that he gets the rampage i like he uh he gets he gets more he gets more here yeah and he gets uh, the rampage he, we get to see a side of the sulong that we didn't with carrot because carrot knows how to use it so now we kind of get a sense of like what she was trained not to do <laughs> mm-hmm. so that's yeah. interesting uh and like i peckham's was not like one of the most memorable parts of this kind of final stretch of the arc for me but they really well it's because of what you were talking about the way yeah. he sort of went out yeah, like he kind of shows up. You're like, oh yeah, that's right, he's here, and then he goes away. Uh, but here they really, they really make something of it. I was, I was really impressed. Right, cool. Right, uh, are we, are we ready to move on to the next segment? Sure, I'm looking forward to the next week's anime. Jerma gets, Jerma getting involved. All right, yeah, let's move on. This is the piece together segment, and we are all pirate ghosts. To here oh, to answer, oh. <laughs> here to oh, answer. Oh. <laughs> we're here to answer the questions, comments, and theories that you have. Ed, let's start with. I wish Corn was here to help us answer questions. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> Nibbler. Um, this piece. That's uh, these are from uh, Discord. Uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, we have to answer your questions. It's part of the deal. Uh, so you could join us on Patreon and then join us on Discord. Uh, first one comes from Narthon, who said this probably will be stale by the next episode. But what if Robin simply uses clutch on every single ninja at once would be pretty sweet. Oh, this is from last week. Um, I, she could still do that. Who says? Yeah, yeah that's still uh, possible. Well, it was like she, she upgraded her powers, but it wasn't offensive powers. It was like clone defensive powers. So. That's true. Well, yeah, it Robin, was a big step up in uh, in Robin's powers. I think. I think Robin she's basically had, yeah. she's basically becoming a god at this point. <laughs> like, <laughs> some flash level control over your molecules. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Robin, yeah, you got Yeah, go ahead. yeah. I just gotta. He's gotta pump the brakes a little bit with Robin. I think, and our our big thing is that she hasn't had like a fight in like forever. But I guess when you do have powers like that, you really gotta pump the brakes somehow. Um, but I'd like to see her just plow through dudes i mean not not touching that uh I, I mean robin's powers are kind of more defensive and strategic than they are offensive and uh you know fighting oriented uh which is fine that's, that's her character that's true yeah that's true when rolling her stats she put uh <laughs> She put most of her standard array into uh, into defensive stuff. Oh, okay. And, like consti- constitution and intelligence and wisdom intelligence. versus. And she's got yes, like uh, yeah. she's got like twenty one charisma points. <laughs> mm. Grim Pyro. Am I, am I maybe? Yeah, I just already asked a question to the experts. Uh, I, I seem to remember times where she could can create giant feet. Yep. Uh, made out oh, yeah. of small like when that was in the manga, right? That wasn't an anime mm, movie correct. thing. No, that okay. was no, that, that was in the manga, and she also she also flew with her wings. Yeah, so why doesn't she do that all the time? <laughs> Look, we have I, questions. I feel like that's, yeah, that's probably what Zach was saying, that Oda has yeah. to be careful because then it raises questions like, Alex why doesn't she do this? Why doesn't she do that? Yeah. Like, in theory, yeah. she could beat Luffy at this point. She could just <laughs> smash him repeatedly. Like, but, but Luffy could also make giant hands and feet. That's true. It would be the battle of the giant limb people, for sure. <laughs> oh, my God, I mean, that would be amazing. The series <laughs> has been trending in that direction. We are gigantifying yeah, everything. Yeah. A giant it's going to be like... Um, Asura's wrath, you know, with the giant Buddha finger just smashing oh, all planet yeah. Earth. Oh my god. <laughs> to be fair, we talked about this on a more somewhat more serious point. Toriyama likes miniaturizing a lot of power and uh Oda likes maximizing, you know, like in big beginning. In beginning. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um 
Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think when we get to the end of this series, we're going to see some pretty giant people fighting some pretty giant fights, uh, without a doubt. We have San Juan Wolf in the background. An and that army guy of wars is... is huge, yeah. The entire... Actually, that would be the Game of Thrones book for the end of One Piece, An Army of Warses. What's the guy from Transformers, <laughs> the, the whole planet guy? Unicron. Uh, Unicron. I see... Like a like something on that scale happening Eneru, at the end of the series. coming down from the sky. No, bigger. He's merged oh, with the moon. But yeah, oh, well, maybe. That would be cool if he literally merged with the moon. I've I, given myself a new body. I mean... He would, would just be One Piece Galactus, wouldn't he? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> that would be amazing. I mean, we've what? talked about this before. I mean, Ed, like the idea of the planet being constructed and all of that. Like... Yeah. I, or or at least long designed time. a long long time ago um i like i could see the planet itself being like a player in at the end of this i don't know if, in how yeah. or why but so uh, yeah there's some interesting things that went in a really crazy direction that was one question yeah <laughs> were we talking about robin uh <laughs> the next question said uh, is from grim pyro who says Orochi's design kicks ass. Who'd have thought that such a frumpo would be look this cool? Um, frumpo. Frumpo is a great word. Um, anyway, if Robin started in st stared in her own espionage, sorry, starred. I guess that's a homo homophone, right? Starred in. Oh no, there's supposed to be two R's. It's his fault, not my fault. Um, starred on, in man. her own espionage show. What do you think it would be called? My votes on. Uh, oh, great. Now I have to speak French. L'espion de fleur, uh, which means the flower spy in French. What would you call like that. Robin's spy show? Flower child. <laughs> I don't know. La femme de Nico. <laughs> du double O. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, yeah. right. right after sil silk stockings. Next. I would, hey, Go I ahead. would watch a Saturday afternoon low budget uh sci-fi show starring nico robin thank you very much oh my much. god yes right after right after cleopatra 25 25 and like hercules and xena oh yeah <laughs> uh sequest all oh, right right on the would be an amazing robin <laughs> uh on a not as happy note uh morgul we have to answer all questions on this piece uh said i will understand if you don't want to answer this but i was wondering if you guys have heard about the controversy sur uh, surrounding Vic Mignogna, and if you think that this will affect playing Sabo in the future. I remember you guys interviewed him years ago, and he seemed like such a nice guy. Um, I'll start with the less uh, mercurial question. Uh, we don't know what's happening to Sabo. I'm, I don't know. if Has Funimation released any statement at all about it? Or no? I don't think they have. I don't have. think so, no. Um, so I do know, um, I could say this, uh, I mean, episode of, uh, Sabo is coming out, I think next month on yes. Blu-ray DVD. It's and... already out, I thought. Oh no, I'm, I'm no, sorry. No, I'm thinking 3D2Y. 3D2Y. Yeah. And episode of Sabo, to my knowledge, I was informed, was recorded a little while back. Yeah, so, I'm sure it was. Well, it, was it definitely it... wasn't recorded last month because when someone on Twitter asked me, I don't get how they could have got Ed Blaylock back with Son Goku when he's dead. Ooh, ooh. And I was just like... Yeah, it's like maybe they recorded this before. He died. I thought I thought episode of Sabo came out. <laughs> we're kidding. Uh, the dub came out streaming a while ago, right? No, the, no, the regular the one came out. Cast did. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I thought there was yeah, also a dub that was that Crunchyroll. Yeah, I might be thinking 3D2. Why did they do the dub streaming simultaneously? Or no, 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 none of them. Simulcast. Okay, no, the disc just came out a couple of weeks ago. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so just to address, part of that question, to address the Vic thing. Uh, and Ed and I were talking a little bit about this before we started recording, and I posted it on my Twitter account that there is literally a video of Vic Mignogna humping my face at the 2010 Kasukan. Kasukan. Yeah, the Gaylord, yeah. Uh, and that, we were in, awesome. like, for his rehearsal for his performance that he was going to do. Yeah, and I was... was it was weird, and I wasn't gonna. I think we like we we joked about it then, and right before we put it in a promo video for our. We tried to do a video podcast back then. Yeah, that did you it. made like a sizzle reel for it, and that there was yeah. footage of it. Well, because it was odd and ridiculous. Um, yeah. But then I saw he was also doing it to other people in the audience besides me, 
when I kind of skimmed through the video before and I'm like, okay, this, I guess, shows this kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, shows that pattern of behavior continuing. Um, so yeah, yeah. Okay. He seemed like a nice guy. That was first off his job. Second off, you could seem nice and do nice things and also do crappy things. Um, and I, I think people forget that you could have had a good experience with someone, but that doesn't mean they also don't, you know, do bad things. Um, and what's really up to him, uh, is to, you know, make peace with the, the people who he did harm, whether he meant to harm them or not. Um, and make peace with those who he needs you know, to make peace with himself. He needs to make peace with himself. Yeah. I think is almost the most, is the most important thing for him. Um, yeah. and I know, uh, Monica real, I think, uh, posted a bunch about how she, you know, tried to talk to him and say, you need to find some help for yourself. Um, you know, this is going, this is going too far. Um, you know, I, I want you to find help and he, hopefully he will find that help that he does need. Uh, but in, in the meanwhile, you know, uh, I think it probably would be a good idea for, you know, to kind of answer the question this, this, uh, per, that Morgan asked. Um, he should probably step back from his work to work on himself. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go to emails. Uh, first, first one here uh, comes from Dark Leviathan, who says, first off, hi, you guys are great. And um, I love to listen to the podcast when I'm at work. Makes me laugh. Second, Zach said that if Jill didn't make her host episode by the end of 2018, she would lose her chance at the episode by the statute of limitations of the contest, <laughs> which I made up, let's be fair. Uh, she doesn't own owe us an episode, but I still would love to see if she's up to do a special on the side. She's welcome to. I, I, I was kidding about the statute of limitations. We still want I a Jill episode. <laughs> uh, gonna, yeah, we need to have Jill back. She just happens to, she, she's usually working on Sunday nights, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh also uh dark leviathan notes that we did repeat our celestial dragon quiz from last week which i had a feeling about but whatever uh but we still did pretty bad on it if i recall anyway uh she'll let it slide um but uh he'll let it slide sorry and well i actually don't know the gender of this person uh so now the trivia score I'm gonna bring this in uh so oh. i'll go backward Greg, who hasn't appeared too much, has one Taiyaki. Roger has a donut. Jill has a donut. Sam has two donuts and a Taiyaki. Ryan has a... Brian, I think they meant, has a margarita and a Taiyaki. I don't remember the margar... <laughs> oh! That was for uh, Mary Joa, right? Or Mary Joa. Did I say Mary Joa? I don't know. Anyway, Steve has four a donuts. Margarita? Margarita. I think that's where we came up with that. Four donuts, a margarita, and a Taiyaki. Kelly has oh, yeah. a donut. Uh, Alex has three and a half donuts and three and a half Taiyaki. That's weird how that happened. Whoa. I and, thought I, man, I thought I did way worse than that. Nice. And uh, Ed has three and a half donuts and five Taiyaki, which <laughs> I guess means you're winning, Ed. But I you guess. are on the most shows. <laughs> so that makes sense. It's been on all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am here a lot. And yeah, Dark Leviathan said he wants to send us a list. Please send me a list because I have not been back at all. If he he could even Son put, I know all the all the donut obligations were met at your wedding. Well, for the people who were there, um, really? yeah. I, otherwise, not for me, I really will, didn't have a donut. Oh my god! I'll send you guys donuts. Um, next one comes from Patrick, who said, "By the way." I know, Nathan, do you not understand even what I just said for the last time? Oh, no, it was like listening to someone try to explain all the Kingdom Hearts lore. Uh, I was just kind of roll off the ride. We have trivia at the end of every show, and for each arc, I give out different prizes, and that's just the current score. Ah, that's all you need okay. to know. Tayaki gotcha. is just, you know, Tayaki is like that cookie thing that uh, Shirohoshi wore on the back of her. It's just like a fish cookie. I mean, it's an actual cookie right, shaped right. like a fish. I'm also explaining for everyone else out there who does not know what the hell I'm talking about. Not just, I'm not trying to just, uh, no, no, no. I, I, pre I don't mind being the cipher for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> the Usopp for the audience. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick, uh, has a new one who says, I've only been listening to the podcast, uh, since the new year, despite my inability to partake in the conversation, it feels really great to hear other people talk about one piece after reading it on my own for 12 years. I really get a kick out of rereading it with you all because of how much I miss on my first time through. And he's excited to bitch our entire catalog. Good luck. Um, secondly, uh, during the chapter in which Big Mom invades Wano, 
Someone on the podcast theorized that con that theorized that Kaido and Lin Lin could be connected by having a childhood together long ago. With no research to back this up because of my own laziness, what do you think of the idea that Katakuri is Kaido's son? It would be a great way to reach out, uh, round out the arc of Katakuri's story by having him save his mother in her new amnesiac state by confronting his father, real Freudian shiznit, if you catch my drift. <laughs> Thoughts? Uh, Wouldn't isn't... that also mean that Daifuku and Oven are Kaido's kids? Because I thought they were triplets. Yeah. yeah. My boy, Amore <laughs> Eel. Pelican <laughs> <laughs> um, Eel. Pelican Eel, my mistake. Any other thoughts on that? It's a lot. Okay. Mm, yeah. Good theory. Probably. Would. <laughs> hey, what if it's what if Snack is their kid? Like the reason that like <laughs> Snack has been obscured in the manga for some reason. I don't. Yeah. I still don't understand he, why he was obscured in the manga. Me because either. He it he was defeated by Yerush. That's why. Yeah. Well. Yeah, but no, he shows no, up. No, he comes like, back well, later. Yeah. yeah. Show up at the cow. But he's like, no one want. Oh, just like no one should see this guy. He's yeah. he's not a he's not a good looking guy. No one gives a crap about Snack. <laughs> he's the new rock star. Um. <laughs> again, old reference. Um. Next one comes from Timothy, uh, who his P.S. I'm going to start with saying Zach love every Japanese pronunciation you do. Ignore these bullies. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> his question or his thought here um last week there was a lot of discussion about the germa double six comic strip and how it applied to the current germa double six given the reveal of stealth black number three for sanji uh so tim thinks that both the current germa double six color scheme and the marine propaganda comic strip are based off of the same relatively ancient events events uh 300 years ago Germa, Germa took over the North Blue because of five Devil Fruit users. The the one who had a uh, sparking red was Borsalino's. Uh, Dengeki Blue oh, was Enaru's, he says. Stealth what? Black was Absalom's. And Poison Pink was Magellan's. And Winch Green, no one knows, but I'm going to just say here, no one cares. Um, <laughs> they were defeated by a person called Sora who destroyed Germa, ending their tyranny, and the Marines republished the legend, casting Sora as a Marine, much like today's comic reuse mythology, and judge because he is obsessed with reforming, reforming the Germa kingdom. What do you guys think? This is very involved. I think some of that is is interesting because there are definitely kind of unanswered questions about that. I don't I don't know if I believe that, that Oda would, would get that specific as far as, like, you know, pointing out that these were all the various fruits that we've already seen, but, um, they definitely mimic fruits, right? What's that? Uh, They definitely mimic fruits a little, like those fruits. They're very similar. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, they're elemental powers. So it has, you know, written hundreds of devil fruits at this point. So, um, there's definitely some overlap, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I do think there is something to like, the idea of judge trying to live up to the past and therefore like these, these sort of figures being sort of a, a, a Germa like myth, uh, almost like the, the mythic founders of Germa and that he fashioned his kids after them is, is a possibility, but it's also just kind of so weird. Like, I don't know. I, I would really like to see more about that to, to understand the full context, because I feel like the explanation that we got in Hook Egg Island is definitely not complete. Um, as far as how that all fits together. It's very any, other, any other thoughts? Uh, let's move on to Reddit, Stephen. All right. Uh, we will start with I, Emma, Ima Ivano M, who uh, has a, uh, a who points out that um, here's great headed Orochi doing something Luffy did that one time he tried to be a samurai in chapter 913 with the tossing of the sword sheath. So, yeah, like I mentioned Uh, On that page, uh, he does toss the sheath down when he draws his sword. I don't know about you guys, but I think Oda is trying to tell us something here regarding Orochi's sword skills. I think Orochi might be a bigger fraud than we anticipated. What do you think? Keep up the good work. I mean, I don't know. Does anybody think that Orochi is like a legitimate samurai warrior? No. I mean... Mm. I think that might go to some of that. Par- he has a lot of paranoia going on, but the mm-hmm. 
the he's fact a that big dude and he, he's apparently quite physically powerful, even if he looks like a dweeb. Well, he might not be. That might be why he's like, well, you don't think I defeated uh, Odin? I, I'm the one who did that. Uh, like, mm. he might have, it might have been kind of a happenstance thing that, that brought that about. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. The other weird thing was that, like, they talked to, the, the little kids talked about him being, like, the two-sword guy um, in that classroom scene. Uh, but he only uses one sword here. That might not mean anything, but, um, you know... Like you would expect if he was really this like dual wielding badass that we would have seen more of that. But he tried and failed to kill a little kid. So it says something, I guess. Uh, Fierce Alchemist says Kyoshiro got more focused this chapter than I was expecting. Seems like he has his own ambitions for the throne. What do you think his role in the coming conflict is going to be? Um, I still suspect that he is one of the the nine uh, samurai in that similar to Shutamaru who like is uh, he, Shutamaru sort of lost faith in like the you know the goodness of man or whatever like there's no heroes that he can follow anymore I feel like Kyoshiro is kind of similar where he he just went full like survival and and like uh, is sort of building a criminal enterprise on his own uh, out of ambition. But I, I still feel like just because of the profile of his character, like it's too hard not to see him as being one of these uh, pivotal figures from the past. That's my take on it. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts. Nope. Uh, Mistress page says, I have a theory in regards to Queens devil fruit. When we saw Jack in his ships attack Zunisha, you can see some ships with scorpion figureheads. We also know Jack's ship have mammoth heads, so maybe it's a hint towards Queen being an ancient scorpion, Zoan. Also, if you look at the way his hair is styled, it looks similar to a scorpion tail. Plus, he's dubbed as the plague, which could hint towards use of poisons. Thoughts? Uh, the, the the masthead of the ship is the best evidence I've seen then. Mm-hmm. I, they, I yeah. think they all have ancient. Like ancient. Yeah. yeah. I was because so we had Jack, who's a woolly mammoth. Right. Um, King, who's a not a pterodon. 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 Yeah. Pteranodon. Pteranodon. Um, and we have obviously uh, Drake and Page One. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a I dinosaur, think... but I would think maybe someone said like saber tooth tiger or something like that. Yeah, what What are the other big like extinct animals that are terrifying? Um, giant sloths. Uh. <laughs> Tri- trilobites uh there's an, <laughs> yeah, like giant, a giant insect or something oh my god oh yeah yeah that's like that is like uh so in, in the new pokemon game uh sun and moon there's a like the magikarp analog for this uh for that latest generation uh turns into this giant it's a little trilobite and it's a little weak trilobite and and uh when it evolves it turns into this giant gargantuan monstrous looking insect thing uh mm. so food for thought there I'm calling a dodo. Oh, yeah. that would be amazing. Oh <laughs> that, Especially as a gag character. Yeah. I would love that. And that, what, I'm not, I'm and not what, lie. this was, this awesome. is Queen we're talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. Who's wearing that get a, like, I forget, it was something ridiculous, <laughs> but that as a dodo. a dodo, that's pretty great. I like the giant slots too. That's, a, that's yeah. another good one. Uh, all right, Akazaya Nine says, uh, "Do you think Kumarasaki is about to declare to everyone that she is Kozuki Hiyori? I didn't expect this to be revealed so soon, and I also wonder how much Kyoshiro knows about her. Uh, but I'm confused as to why Kyoshiro referred to her as a geisha. Isn't she an Oiran that is a high class courtesan? I thought Oda was keeping that distinction, like in Japanese history. Um, well, I think for the first one, we did kind of talk about that um, during the uh, the recap that." We feel like, you know, Kyoshiro must he, he must know something about her her background because they seem to have a, a pretty close personal relationship. Um, as far as the uh, the Geisha Oyeron thing. Yeah, I think technically he does. He when when he I, I had him referring to her as a Geisha, it was really more like, a, you know, a courtesan or a, a pleasure woman. Um, I, I've been kind of. Uh, I guess fudging the the lines a little bit because it's not always clear just kind of historically speaking um, like sort of the the roles of different there's there's a a kind of wide array of 
you know, sort of either pleasure women or entertaining women or, uh, you know, these these various um, kind of figures. And some of them are definitely like explicitly prostitutes and and some are not. And uh, it's a little tricky because Oda is definitely like playing very coy. Like he definitely does not want to like directly address, uh, you know, like like openly sexual matters or talking about these characters or banging or whatever, you know, like you remember that whole thing about uh, Violet and Doflamingo and how he was like, yeah, I'll just leave that to your imagination. So I feel like he's not going to like be that open about like this character, you know, these women are, are prostitutes or whatever. So they're just sort of like entertainment women in, in a sense. And they're all here to like liven up this party. Um, and so I don't necessarily want to, uh, to, to stray too far in terms of like stating things that Oda may not be intending to uh, depict directly. So I don't know. I'll give it a second thought when I, uh, when I go back to, uh, to revise them for the graphic novel, cause I always look at, at everything. Um, but um, that's kind of my, I guess my, my mindset on how I'm handling that stuff right now. Uh, Gladius wing zero says what a treat of a chapter this week seeing Robin get her first taste of action in about three years felt great and Orochi seems way more interesting and and important than his appearance initially suggested anyway my question is with us now deep into Wano what potential storyline or teased moment are you most excited for I can't wait for the flashback on how Orochi managed to align with Kaido um, I'm really looking forward to, yeah, the Odin flashback. I really want to see what this character looks like, uh, what the deal is, because Oda set a very high bar with like the reactions that the uh, the Straw Hats were having to like uh, Kinemon telling the story. So I feel like it's got to be a good one, yes. um, and we're definitely going to get it. Particularly Luffy's reaction, right? Like this is the first time he's ever actually sat down and listened to somebody's story and cared about right. it. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm like ju- judging by the way Wano has gone so far and how intricately planned it seemed on Oda's part. I think uh, we're in for a real doozy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. Uh, Grand Reboot says, I've been thinking real hard on important issues in life, like how will I finish my college degree this year? Can I pay rent? And most important of all, is Nami lesbian? Why that last one? Well, why not? Here's the evidence. Khalifa of CP9 reveals that she has the soap soap fruit and Nami reacts by saying so sexy. When Usopp asked why she let the kids on Punk Hazard go with the Marines, she said, I can't say no to a female Marine. Nami and Wanda, the dog mink, had already exchanged clothing and during their farewell, they couldn't get their hands off of each other. What do you think? P.S. This is meant to be a lighthearted, fun comment. Cool, because I was about to be like, Stephen, can we confirm that was the translation in uh, <laughs> during Andy's lobby, the official? I, yeah, um, I, I don't remember that. I don't I know. Think that's the, about as overt as Oda's gonna get. Like, yeah, right. like, yeah. He's been. Clear I will about say that. this at least, not to totally. Sh- I'm not shooting it down, but when during Punk Hazard, when she said, "I can't say no to a female Marine," obviously she's thinking of her adoptive mother, Bellamy. Right. That's right. why. But um, I think, Stephen, you kind of like already answered this question when you were talking about the uh, the geishas earlier. Right. Yeah. No, I don't expect him to to um, to come out and say that. But, you know, it is it, I think it is fair to point out that like Nami has very explicitly never shown any interest in a a guy character. And I think part of that is in service of like her, you know, sort of not like not pandering in that sense, at least like of, of her being sort of like a Bulma character where she's just like, Ooh, Yamcha, you know, this guy's hot. And you know, all these, these sort of jokes like that, like she's always the, the one who is manipulating uh, guys and it's definitely never the other way around. So I can see why, like how that, that uh, dynamic sort of gets created. Um, you know, whether or not that's uh, meant to be read right into the character, I think that's just sort of like, okay, if you if you if you want to imagine that if that's you know your head canon, uh, I think you know go go crazy with it. And it also but, wouldn't um, be out of line with what we know about actual female pirates, you know, from the age of piracy too. Yeah, probably sure. I mean, there there is a lot of sexual fluidity in actual yeah. piracy anyway. But um, also, she's in love with money. 
Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't see her being that romantically interested in anything or anyone that isn't money based. She's a very sexual. Right. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. That's that's well a, said. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, and thinking on it too. Like, uh, I think a lot of you know, um, uh, I know Oda gets a lot of flack for all of his women looking the same in terms of like how they're drawn, but. When you think about it, like it, all he writes all of his women very, very differently too. Because um, I was, as we were talking, I was thinking about um, how Hancock pines after Luffy, and yeah, we've never seen anything like that from Nami or or Robin, and they all have uh, they all have very different priorities. They all have very different uh, things that they focus on, um, and it's all uh, it all goes back to every one of these characters has a dream that they want to achieve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of what they show towards, like affection towards, has to do with that dream. Uh, whether it be Luffy, whether it be money, whether it be uh, the true history, whether it be wanting to become a brave warrior of the sea. Like that's, I, I th- uh, that is, I think the true, um, that's where it li- that's where the true shonen spirit lies. It's within these characters' wants and needs. Um, and I think at one point Oda even said that like, oh yeah, this, there really won't be any romantic, uh, mm-hmm. like, uh, um, writing Fiction. in this. Yeah. yeah. It, it's part of what sets it apart from every other Shonen series that does have to eventually go there with all of their characters. It's kind of a nice change of pace that none of the Straw Hats seem particularly romantically interested in anyone. Um, sans Sanji. He's like, the, <laughs> he's enough of a horn dog and romantically focused for everybody. I Is think. that really so romance? Of, <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it is one person's interpretation of it, yes. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. cast aspersions on people. But, but yeah, I, 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 almost, I almost read a, uh, Luffy as Ace a lot of times because he just seems mm-hmm. so uninterested in anyone or anything in that, in that regard. But um, mm-hmm. that's just I, – I, I like that Oda leaves things open to interpretation. It doesn't try to define those things for people um, because yeah. I, think, I think the best fiction that really thrives and has a, uh, a longstanding fandom is sort of – modular in that department and lets people kind of read in or not read into things however they want so they can project onto those characters and it's like sort of what happens with the overwatch fandom for instance everyone can kind of see every character related to other characters in whatever way they want um and that helps grow the fandom so i think it's part of the long-standing i think appeal to these characters to people yeah very very good comments there you go see these these lighthearted questions, you can still get good commentary out of them. Uh, last question from Reddit is from Pencils for Life. Uh, it says, I know not all of you are gamers, but Jump Force comes out next week. And One Piece has six fighters representing it. Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, Sabo, Hancock, and Blackbeard. Are there any characters you wish were included or any you were surprised were left out? Personally, I'm surprised, happily so that Ace Law and Doflamingo were left out in favor of more Straw Hats and Blackbeard. Uh, P.S. I know a lot of you guys are big JoJo fans, and Jotaro and Dio were also confirmed for the game. Uh, I'm not picking it up. Uh, yep. I kind of wish Frankie was in it, though. Oh, oh man, yeah, that would be, be fun. Uh, yeah, I also am not picking it up. I think it looks uh, uh, fuck ugly. As the kids say. <laughs> hey, uh, so if if Frankie was in it and, you know, he had his nipple lights, uh, would they have done all the details of his areolas? Oh, my God. <laughs> look like ultra realistic, like photorealistic nipples. Yeah, it'd be like those um, uh, Ren and Stimpy close ups. <laughs> um, I, I get what they're going for with the look of the game. It's like, oh, it's these manga characters existing in the real world. Doesn't it just because you. You, you you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, Roger Rabbit was about cartoons existing <laughs> in the real world, and they didn't look, uh, as the kids say, fuck ugly. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I I don't know. Like, if 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 it turns out the game's mechanics are actually fun, I might think about buying it during like a flash sale or something like that, like I did with, uh, um, Burning Blood. But, no, no, not Burning Blood. I did buy that on a flash sale, and I would have paid full price for that game. I mm. love Burning Blood. Um, the other jump uh, crossover, the game that mm. came out for um, oh, uh, it's for jumps. The, well, the DS ones are awesome. I uh, forgot the one that came out on like PS3. It's like J Star something or other, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, uh, J, uh, jump uh, J Star's victory, right? Yeah, I, I played a little bit of that, and I 
the mechanics weren't good, and I didn't particularly like. I mean, the look of it was okay, but like I don't know. Out of everything I've seen for that game, the only characters that really appeal to me visually are the JoJo characters. They look great. Uh, In the new game, yeah. Uh, it's just I I can't get myself. And I know we have some Pirate Warriors fans on our staff, you know, and probably those mm-hmm. listening, but. I get really tired really quick of just running around, just smashing the same buttons and just fighting off like hordes and hordes of uh, schmucks. I, it's that's like, this is not for me. You know, that's not the kind of game I enjoy playing, especially well, not for long. I think uh, Pirate Warriors, I don't think I've ever beaten any of those games, but I'll do like one chapter. And I think that usually takes around like 20 minutes or so. And I'm like just exhausted after it. <laughs> like I'm done. Yeah. I turn it off. And isn't there another One Piece game coming out like right yeah. afterwards? Like World mm-hmm. Seeker, I think is what it's called. Yeah. yeah. This, well, this this game, the Jump Force game, is like a fighting game, sure. which I'm I'm not really interested in in that genre, so I'm just gonna skip it too. But uh, World Seeker is more like a you know action adventure sort of open. I guess they're they're sort of styling it as an open world type of of game. But I'm I'm actually looking forward to that one. I know that. Uh, the advanced opinions have been kind of mixed. They've had some public demos and stuff on at events and stuff, but I, I'm actually really, really looking forward to it. It's been a little while since we've had a, a like a one piece sort of adventure game. So um, I hope I'm hoping that one is good. Yeah. It looks like unlimited adventure by way of like Spider-Man or something from the trailer right. I'm looking at, which right. is Lots. a pretty great combo of ideas in theory. If they can pull mm-hmm. it off. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's a big F. Yeah. Um, so I that's think, it for Reddit. Uh, Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think Steve will agree in that uh, they should make a One Piece uh, One Piece adventure game in, in the uh, style of Wind Waker in terms I should, of... I should patent that idea because I've like said that <laughs> publicly so many times. I mean, that's the reason that I liked Wind Waker when it came out, because uh, I was I, I had just really gotten into One Piece at the time. Um, mm. I'll, I'll say and, this because I'm a terrible person. Uh, I haven't beaten Wind Waker still. Um, it's really? It's like two dungeons. <laughs> I, the, tri- the Triforce Hunt took some time. It's a long story, but you know, I have the version on the Wii U too, and people say like, "Oh, well, they made the Triforce Hunt shorter, and uh, they added shortcuts, so I don't have to sail as long." And I always say, "But I like the sailing. It's real <laughs> yeah. taxing. That's the fun part. Do you listen to the music in that game? It's it's incredible. Uh, I, I would I would love to see a return of that. Remember that Game Boy Advance game uh, of One Piece that came out back whenever like the four kids that was. I never played. It was, played. It was, oh, was really it the interesting. Side there, it was, yeah, yeah, but it was it had an interesting take on that genre with Luffy's powers. I kind of would like to see them some something like that done again, but you know, a little bit more com- uh, complexity to the mechanics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ed, I mean, yo, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say there just needs to be uh, more uh, really high quality two D side scrollers. Just I'm just yeah. gonna say that in general. Mm-hmm. From a video yeah. game standpoint, but it's me. Uh, Ed, it's time to piece the tweet. What do we got this week? Uh, first one is from Emil Nordpol, who sent us a picture of a One Piece inspired Keyblade. So you can check that out. The piece the tweet hashtag. It's from a few days ago. Uh, next question comes from Pongzilla, who says if you could put any of the seven warlords. On the Guild of Calamitous Intent from Venture Brothers, who would it be? <laughs> All of them. Uh, Moria, I think. I, Moria. Ooh, yeah, he would fit. Moria and Buggy. I, Buggy, because Mr. Three comes with him. And Mr. Three is even more of a Venture Brothers character than Buggy is. Wow, like Buggy and Mr. Three are like the Monarch and Gary of One Piece. <laughs> In a way, I could see that. Who the fuck is Galdino? <laughs> that was in the episode title. Oh, <laughs> yeah, one day. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else. Uh, uh, I, I Maybe don't flamingo if they did like a completely different take on him. So the Funk Brothers, I think, would be great. <laughs> uh, except they would. Uh, except they'd have to have like a really, a really snappy. Snappy name like uh, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head right this second. Wait, you don't um, think they should be called the Funk Brothers anymore? No, because if they're if they're doing Guild of Calamitous Intent, it has to be like punny. 
or yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, going to wearing a jacket. Like uh uh what's that um isn't there a band called My Something Jacket? My, My morning, morning jacket. jacket. Yeah. My morning jacket, yeah. Really? I don't know. My, you could call it. My, they could call themselves my Maury jacket, and one of them is named Maury. <laughs> <laughs> the the jacket one, uh, Terry Funk or Bobby Funk? No, Terry Funk is the one with the jacket powers. Anyway, no, oh, and that's Kelly Funk, but he's based off of Terry Funk. Fuck Reverse me. question: <laughs> Which uh, Venture Brothers character would you like to see be a One Piece pirate? Oh, uh, there we go. That's a that's a fun shore one. leave. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Isn't that already uh, That's character? the best answer. Yeah. Like Shoreleave would have so much fun. Especially oh god. He would Sergeant Hatred, I for me, I think, would be really fun. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. That's a good he answer have, like, too. Like is he have like a big tank ship, which <laughs> sort of already exists, but mm. he's kind oh, of a uh, capone. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> god, I, I've been watching so much Adventure Brothers lately, I wish uh and I can't think of it. Dr. Orpheus would be a great one piece. Yeah. Character. Well, the oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Dr. Orpheus, Dr. Fit. Dr. Fit, you know. Um, OK. What's next? Uh, next one comes from CEO253, who says, hey, OPP, I think Orochi's Ninja Squad sets up Samurai versus Ninja slash Straw Hat versus Beast Pirate, giving the Kozuki the visual victory for the people of Wano. Mama will get just enough memory back to shuffle her off to Elbaf. Setting up that conflict in the D equals Don Quixote. I'm not sure what that last part's about, but I think maybe he means that's what the D stands for, uh, even though it's already the name of a character. Yeah, I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I do like the idea of going to Elba next. That's why Mama would have to lose her some of her memories. Oh shit! That would be actually that would be really awesome. Uh, oh yeah, I do like that part of it. I do like that part of it. Like, uh, you know how Oda was talking about a boss character joining the Straw Hats? Um, well, I mean, Jinbei, of course, is the obvious uh, obvious answer for that. But what if he meant somebody bigger, like Big Mom? And yeah, she has Whoa. to get all her memories back by going to Elbaf, where she Whoa. fucking grew up. Wait, or Alex, what? are we actually here positing Big Mom joining the Straw Hats? I just want to uh, clear, uh -huh. clear everything. Okay, yeah. just making sure. That's joining right. like Vivi style, yeah. Yeah, I yeah you know what? Fuck it. You know what? We're not getting penalized for this. I'm no. throwing that out there. Okay. <laughs> I'm throwing that it's out there. there. I just want to I want to make sure it's said. Yes, go ahead. It's a, I'm it's thinking a maybe plot theory without any maybe evidence. If, maybe if her like memory kind of reverts back to her as a child, she's like, "Oh, I got to go home to Elbaf. That's where I live." Oh, man. Mm. That too. Like, god. You guys I feel like Sam is going to be so pissed if Big Mom is the one character who does join the strats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that adds a whole yeah. other level. Okay. The next one comes from Daniel Venard, who says, do you think Orochi's Hydra heads have different personalities? I was getting that vibe from, because they all, they, all, they all look different. They all have a uniqueness to them. Yeah, not as much as I would have expected if that was, if that's going to be the case, I guess. Like, he didn't, he didn't make it really over the top obvious that they they're all different. They're just very slightly um, different. But I, I mean, that's kind of like the where where you got to take it, right? Take that character trope of having all the heads. They got to have different personalities. Um. Okay. Next one comes from Andreas Solheim, who says, "Hey, OPP, much love from Norway and first time contribution, Andreas. What?" Is your thoughts on Komurasaki now being Momo's sister and possibly crying under the mask she always uses when playing this song? Is it a song from their parents? Mm. First of all, hello, welcome. Yeah, <laughs> Norway is nice a beautiful hear. country. Having been, yeah. Um, I don't know. I I I think we're going to one hundred percent find out before this arc is done. I think I could say that for sure. Does anyone else have opinions? I, I mean, do like the idea. At all. Yeah. I do like it. It come the idea that the song comes down from the family. Yeah, yeah, that that did seem like a likely uh, possibility when uh, when they pointed that out. Mm -hmm. All right, next one comes from ninety one Ryan, who says, "Today I learned that Kumurasaki has an excellent pimp hand. If you make her mad, <laughs> it's kind of an inver <laughs> inversion of the social rule there. Good um, for her." Did she yeah, use her backhand or did she use her front? 
I guess check, check the tape. I think on it was a front. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. She well, she does keep it strong. So. Uh, <laughs> next one comes uh, our friend of the podcast. Joe says Robin and Kurosaki are so cool, and I love them. Many heart emojis. Agree. Mm-hmm. And Including last emojis. One, last one comes from Ghost Starch, who says, "In this arc full of dinosaurs, I hope we'll see Sanji activate hell memories, fly really high, and come crashing down on his opponent, calling the attack something like." Hell Memories Asteroid Extinction. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. So that's everything? Well, that. uh, that's everything. Okay. Uh, let's round off. This has been the One Piece Podcast, episode 556 for February 10th. Uh, thank you all for coming on the show. I have a very special v card Card-esque uh, trivia segment coming up in a second. But first, let's go through how people could contact each of you guys. Nathan, where can people find you? Sure. Um, you can actually find out information on the indie game studio that I run uh, called Doxin Studios at daxnd.com. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook, daxnd. Um, I'm me and my uh, creative partner. We both used to work at Telltale, and we are making a space pirate adventure game slash interactive narrative kind of inspired by um telltale games but also M- monkey island is a big influence on us but we kind of throw all of our influences in because we're both big age of sale nerds um so like obviously one piece but also um captain harlock adventure brothers is a comedic influence on us big time i know we've been talking about that a lot today <laughs> um but yeah it's, it's just about a group of space pirates trying to carve out a, a, a existence in a in a society that doesn't accept them, so there's a lot of a lot of through lines between both One Piece and our our game we're making called Slipstream Scalawags. You can also find a website on that, slipstreamscalawags.com. So that's pretty much it for me. The only thing more awesome than regular pirates or space pirates, um, as for we sure. all know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Stephen, where could people find you? Uh, I may be found on Twitter at Translatosaurus. Uh, cat pictures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How is your cat doing? Uh, he's doing better. He's yeah. he's very knocked out by all the medication. Oh yeah, so I forgot he's about just that. Sleeping mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah, uh-huh. good to hear. Uh, well, mm-hmm. good to hear he's doing better. Yeah, not yeah the, he's I, I mean, the sleeping all the time depends. On Zach, that. your intentions were no. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr. Steve Yurko is the username. I like to say I draw, but I haven't been on social media lately. I've been so busy, but like I will post about the Sonic the Hedgehog theme party I had over the weekend. So really fun, you could, actually. it was a great time. I got to say, um, you could follow me there and uh, listen to the other podcasts I'm on I'm doing the deep end, the adult swim podcast with uh, cartoon one uh Matthew J. And I'm also doing tune sweet, which is the wrestling entrance theme podcast with a good friend, doctor. We just released our triple H episode last week. I apologize for my crappy audio, but that is also a really good episode. So if you know what I'm talking about right now, check it out. Uh, Alex, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at dude exclamation, all one word. And um, please listen to Toho Yaro, uh, the Japanese film club podcast that I do with Joey and Scott. Um, our next episode is Lone Wolf and Cub, Sort of Vengeance. Uh, that episode should be dropping hopefully in the next couple days. I'm supposed to record tonight with them, so that should be fun. Uh, and you can listen to us on Spotify now. Holy shit. So, yep. Oh, also superartfight.com slash merch by the card game I worked on called Cute Animals on Fire. A lot of fun. Play it with your friends. And check out Weeb Simpsons also on Twitter. And I'm done with my plugs. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Ed, where could the good people out there find us? Well, my Twitter is at Edward E. One Piece. And my other Twitter is Weeb Trailers, where I post all sorts of old trailers that I get up from old anime DVDs. And you get to see them, too. Well, some of them are pretty weird. <laughs> Stupid weird. I'm I'm Zach Sorry. under. Uh, by the Every way, time you say weird, I'm just gonna say that. So yeah. I apologize. I'm Zach underscore Logan. I'm taking a cue from Steven and just doing dog pictures. So you could, nice. you know, you Good could choice. have both there. Yeah, I'm, I'm just switching, you know, politics and all that. Just dog pictures. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> and the podcast can be found at onepiecepodcast.com, twitter.com, youtube.com, and facebook.com slash onepiecepodcast. OnePiecePodcast at gmail.com is our email address. OnePiecePodcast is our Skype name 
please support us. Patreon.com slash One Piece Podcast. Our subreddit is r slash One Piece Podcast. You can leave us some piece together there. You can subscribe on SoundCloud. Um, subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Or call us on our phone number, Zach. That phone number is 347-497-MAJI. Maji. That phone Maji. number, again, is 347-497-6254. Call anytime. Call anytime. With your questions, your comments, your theories, I, I don't have anything else. Um, we have uh, a fun trivia this week. So um, I've been putting together all my V-Very card booster packs as I've been recording because I am really good at multitasking, which is not true. Uh, so today we are going to go through one of the booster packs was for the worst generation. And I'm going to, I have six facts about each of the worst generation, whoever could get the most facts about the member that they choose besides Luffy and Zoro. They're out. Uh, will win. Okay. Uh, it, some of these are numbers. So if you get them close, I'll give you one point, but if you get it exactly, I'll give you two points and I'll let you know when that happens. Okay. So the choices of characters and I'll repeat them if you'd like are going to be Marshall D teach law kid, Apu, Hawkins, Beige, Drake, Killer, Bonnie, and Arouge. Okay, got it? So I'm going to go around at each of you and in the order that we did the manga recap, and you get to choose which character you want to guess about, okay? So this is similar to, we did this with like the Straw Hats exactly. ones, right? Yeah, a little okay. while back, yeah. It was yeah. a fun departure. It just takes a lot more work for me to put it together. Um, so, Ed, I'm going to give you first shot here. Uh, okay. who, which character would you like to guess information about? They're mostly all going to be the same information with a couple little twists. So go uh, ahead. I'll go, I'll, I'll go with Blackbeard. Blackbeard. So Marshall D. Teach. Uh, first, <laughs> this is the hardest one for these characters. What is his bounty? Oh, uh, 1.5 billion. Oh, I know this one. No. Um, yeah. Like, I'm not going to give, I, we're not going to give a chance to steal. Well, actually, yeah, I mean, Alex, you could say it, but I'm not going to give you any points. Zero. Zero. No, million. what is his current bounty? Blackbeard's current bounty? Blackbeard's current bounty. Does anyone here know? Oh, shit. It's yeah. two billion, right? It's two two billion. billion, 247,600,000. Yes. That's, that's ridiculous. That's the hardest one of this group. Um, <laughs> yeah. What is that his? Is... Wow. Yeah. We forgot shit. about that. Yeah. What is his the, current? The warlords. Yeah. What is Marshall D. Teach's current age? Forty-seven. Mm. Um. Oh, so for the ages, I'm gonna give you the range of the ten. I'll give you one point, and if you get it exactly, I'll give you two points. So his age is forty. So I'll give it, you a point there, Ed, because that's that's getting hard. Same for I the height. He older. Same he for the height. He looks bad for forty. <laughs> <laughs> So if you guess the height within the foot, we're doing mm. uh we're doing American measurements here. Sorry, oh sorry everyone okay. listening. What is his height? Thirteen feet. Nope. Eleven foot three and a half inches. Um holy cow. He's yeah, a, yeah he's a tall guy. Uh big boy. devil fruit. What is what is his devil fruit or fruits? The dark dark fruit. <laughs> and, Yummy. and the uh rumble rumble. Yeah, it's a trouble. Wait, it's the uh, earthquake fruit, not the rumble fruit. That's 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 interesting. I know you know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. You get one point for that. You just have been staff too. Um, what is his birthday? If you get it in the month, I will give you one. If you get it the date, I will give you two. May thirty first. Nope, August third. Yeah. That's our birthday. <laughs> but nice try. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the bonus question for him: What is the debut chapter? What number? If you get it within 10 chapters, I'll give you one. If you get the exact one, I'll give you two. That's hard. Uh, shit. 260. Ooh, 223. Not terrible. Okay. So, Ed, you, you round this off with two points. Um, who, <laughs> was, who was next on our lineup here? Uh, Steve, pick a character. Crap. Um, I'm going to go with Law. You're doing this in the order I wrote it down. It's kind of funny. Okay. Uh, law. So his bounty. You have to get this one exactly. Because it's an easy round number. Hmm. 290 million berries? No, I said it was an easy round number and you picked 290 
Uh, anyway, Nathan, I, you have to uh, I thought I, I thought you said I had to get it like exactly, exactly. I didn't yes. hear around. Yeah, Am I done already? No, you're not done. It uh. keeps going. Nathan, uh, you could take off. It's fine. We'll see. Yeah, you later. thanks for oh. having me on the show, guys. Yeah, Good yeah. Luck with the contest. I would probably bomb this pretty hard anyway. So <laughs> I'm just gonna let you take go my, first. My graceful absence. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you, Nathan. We'll have you on Thank soon, you. hopefully. Thank you. Um, Come on, man. Yeah. Um, okay. So, Steve, age. Within 10, you get one point. Exactly, you get two points. It was 500 million, by the way, his bounty. And this is post-time skip? Post-time skip. Current age. He's 24? Ooh, I'll give you one point. 26. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, height. Within one foot, you get one. Exactly, you get two. Uh, 5'10". He is your height, Steve. He is six foot, three and a half. I would have taken Oh, wow, he's a tall four. boy. Yeah. Um... Ooh, that's an easy one. Okay, what's his devil fruit? Uh, oh, that's easy. It's the gum gum fruit. No, no. <laughs> op op fruit. Yep. Um, birth... Or ope ope no me. Okay, birthday. What is his me. birthday? If you get the month, you get one point. The day is uh, two points. Hmm. He is uh, January 17th. Nope, uh, October 6th. And what he has, you have two choices here. What is Law's favorite food? Oh, crap. I feel <laughs> like he's mentioned this in canon. Uh, oof, uh, mm, God, <laughs> I don't know. He's a weirdo. Uh, Say anything. Something with rice in it. Yeah. Want to be more specific? It's something often mentioned in One Piece. I'll give you that. All right, I'm going to say onigiri. Yeah, I'll give that yeah. to you. Yeah. Do you want to guess the other one or you don't even want to touch the other one? All right. Uh, you know, a big old baguette. You're close. <laughs> Grilled fish. Um, Steven, you're next. Steve, you, you finish this round with three points. You finish this game with three points. Kid, I mean, sorry, any of the <laughs> ones you want. This is the next one on my list. You could pick any of them, uh, Steven. Let's go with Capone. Okay, beige. So, Stephen, what is his bounty? What is his bounty? I'm going to guess it's like, I don't know, like uh, 370 million or something. Um, I will give you one point for that. Oh, no. I'm sorry. This is, sorry. It's a round number. It's 300 million. Oh, Um, wow. uh, Age. Uh, Age. He is 42. Exactly correct. Whoa! Two points. Wow. Um, The height. What is his height? Height. Okay. He's kind of dumpy, so I'm going to say he's like five foot seven. Oh, my God. You're very good at this. Five, five and a half. I'm going to give you oh, one shit. there. Um, I should cosplay Capone. <laughs> <laughs> What's his devil fruit? His devil fruit. Oh my god! I'm. I can't believe I'm not positive on this. Uh, <laughs> is it the castle? Castle fruit? Yep. Yep. Okay. It's, you're not positive because that makes no sense. Should've yeah. Been Capone. <laughs> I almost wanted to say rook rook fruit. And like what is his favorite food? What is his favorite food? Um, I don't know. Pasta. Kind of. Um, you're in the right genre. Uh, meatballs and tomatoes. Meatballs and tomatoes. <laughs> he doesn't like the pasta. Okay. He just, uh, that that seems like a very... Meatballs and tomatoes. It's everything it like but the pasta. It's a very foreign understanding of pasta. <laughs> it's the opposite of the pasta. It's everything but the pasta. Yeah, so Stephen, you, <laughs> no, honey, you, you finished that in round... The sauce. In the sauce. <laughs> you finished that round with four. Nice. Um, so Alex... Your last to go since Nathan rounded off. Uh, what would you like? We still have a bunch of characters left. So what are the choices again? We got remaining Kid, Apu, Hawkins, Drake. Well, and whoever we don't use, we'll use next week. Killer, Bonnie, and Arouge. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll do Killer. Ooh, interesting one. Okay. Because I know I can get at least one of those right. Okay. Killer. Bounty. It's an even number, so again, we're not doing an even number. Yeah. Okay. Um 
killer's bounty, his current bounty, I suppose, right? Mm-hmm. Current. Uh, three hundred and sixty million. No one gets what I say mean by even. Uh, two hundred million. Um. Oh, oh, like a flat. I mean like... flat. I said that for everyone, so you all got that. Um, age. What is his okay. age? Um, I'll say that he is. 23. Oof, I'll give you one point there. 27. I uh, was going to say 27 at first, but I'm like, no, we got to go younger. What is his height? Um, yeah, his I mean, with height. his face, he just looks so young. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll say that he's 5'11". 6 foot 5. So, sorry, you did not get that in there. Um, what is his epithet? Oh, shit. Um, let's see. Uh, God, it should just be killer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wait, I remember this now. If he can't um, think of it, uh, Ed, you could, you could try and what's say What's an it. epithet? <laughs> it's like, uh, a nickname. A nickname, yeah. It's a thing they, uh, yeah, thing like they put Like Cat on Burglar Nami or Fire right. Hunter Zoro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is it, uh, Bloodbath Killer? <laughs> You're close. You're um, actually really it's close. Something with, it's something to do with the show or murder explosion. It's something really to do with close. blood. You're really Yeah, murder that's right. Murder machine. Yeah. Yeah. Murder it machine. It is a really cool yeah. name. Can I give Ed that point? It is a cool I'm just name. a murder machine. Okay. And birth, I don't love what's his birthday? Nobody but kid. Okay, I don't know this. So if I'm you get the if you get the month one, if you get the day two. Alright, so his name is Kita. Uh but I'm just going by the old one piece naming convention. Mm-hmm. Um no. Um, yeah. Is it September? No. no, no. <laughs> it's February it's like 2nd. February 2nd. Okay. Fuck uh, that. What is his favorite food? And if you name the exact type of food, I will give you two points. The exact type so- of this food. Soba noodles? No. no. Uh, it's noodles, though. Kind of, yeah. I know it is. It is. Pasta. Um, pasta. So I'm going to give you the point. Um, do you know the type of pasta? It is an Italian pasta. We'll give you that. It's linguine? I've, I've never heard of this. Aglio e ol- olio. Oh, with garlic. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and garlic oil. and olive oil. Mm. So, Stephen well, is our winner for this first half yeah. of, uh, of oh, this trivia. You will, get, you will get a Taiyaki, though. You will still win your Taiyaki. That's uh, the only reason I. Ch- that's the only reason I chose it because I'm like, well, at least I, I could get that. that. For, <laughs> you I know that for sure. That Zach is going to buy us so much Taiyaki. Yeah, Better. because Wano might last a while. Um, so that's going to do it. Uh, we'll return next week for part two of this exciting round of trivia and also the manga recap and all that. We'll see you then. We have special guest Daniel Dockery, who is a writer for Crunchyroll and Cracked, amongst others. So stay tuned for that. And chapter 933, we're going to talk about that next week. My name is Zach. My name is Ed. My name is Steve. And my name is Alex. And Steven's here also. We'll see you all next week, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Okay. One of these might be Luffy. If Luffy got turned <laughs> into a goat. Or Garp. Garp. I was thinking Garp. garp. Uh, yeah, Garp. Yeah, that's a, that's a Garp goat. Goat Garp. <laughs> garp. Uh, <okay. laughs> garp.
Gorp? The world according to Gorp. Um, <laughs> My son is also named Gorp. 